stakeholder groups met for the first exercise on right sizing the state government, trying to assign values to each type of service and assess the current service level. And then to mix it up, we uh, randomly selected participants to repeat the exercise, but for a different area of government, and then to compare those results all in one morning. Now, some observations I have, I went around and, and, and visited with, with most of the groups, and as a facilitator, I know there's no perfect facilitation process. And any process we had used would have had some frustrations. But some observations, it was really interesting to see how many groups said, we don't like the box we're in here, we want to think a little bit outside the box. So whether it was the group that said, we really can't say we want to, we don't know whether to say we want more or less, because what we really want is we want more Medicaid service for less money, um, as an example. Or a group that said, we really need to talk more about partnerships, whether it's government to government partnerships with tribes, partnerships with local government, partnerships between agencies, better working together will be part of the issue, or just change the paradigm of how we're offering services, or how to, how to get more efficiency, um, either using external dollars or, or other ways. None of those quite fit the boxes that were on the, uh, uh, that, that, that were up on the wall. So clearly there are other options, and this morning's discussion was designed to really start the conversation, not to end it. Now, before I call on the seven group leaders to talk about their groups, I'd like to uh, bring us back to the most important group leader. Please welcome back Governor Bill Walker. I just want to take a moment to once again thank you very much for being here, for participating. I wanted to talk just a second about the sort of the process a bit. Uh, somebody asked me today in, in, in an interview, a media interview, about sort of what we're seeing, what was happening. I said, you know, what's, what's different is that most organizations get together made up of like-minded people. In other words, people normally join organizations that they're like-minded, and so they have sort of a like-minded discussion. We've intentionally not done just the opposite. We brought different, different uh, uh, you know, approaches together, different folks together from different uh, perspectives to have that discussion, to have that dialogue. So, you know, it, and, and this is not necessarily to come out with a, with a final result of any sort. This is not you know, science-based. This is more of a gut check or sort of where we are in various things. But for me, the most important part for me is the dialogue and the discussion. The ones I, I sat in on today, you know, people on, on totally opposite sides of issues, the same issue, but having a discussion about it. And not having an argument, or just an absolute happy discussion. So, and I know it's gotta be a tad bit frustrating from a timing standpoint. We know we sh I wish we had a week. I wish we had two weeks to do this. We don't. So I, I apologize that, that we don't have that. And you probably don't wanna do that for two weeks either. We would, uh, but, but the, our goal isn't to grind this down to an absolute conclusion at all. And as, as Brian said, this is the beginning of a dialogue, the beginning of a discussion. And for me, it's the discussion that's so valuable for me. And I, I, I just, uh, it, it couldn't happen if, we, if you weren't here and if we didn't have the different, different points of view. And you know, we didn't put together a, a group of, of, of timid Alaskans. We put together a group of Alaskans that have opinions and we, we value each one and we want them expressed. So I, I thank you very much for that discussion. Don't feel that you know, if the dots don't go the, you know, a particular way that we're gonna draw from that and say this is an end result. It's not an end result. We're just, it's just kind of you know, getting a feel for kind of where, you know, what's out there. But again, for me personally, it's the discussion that is so powerful. To hear some of that di dialogue this morning in, in the ones that I was able to uh, sit in on was, was very, very, very helpful. So uh, it's a different process um, uh, because we're not trying to, at the end of the day, you know, build a particular product. It's th the product is, is, is what's happening right now. That's the product, uh, what's happening from this morning uh, through, through tomorrow uh, at three o'clock when this wraps up. I think that's when it wraps up. Uh, it, that's the product. So thank you again, and uh, keep doing what you're doing. If it feels a little frustrated, just know it is because that means it's working. And so that's, that's an odd way of putting that. But uh, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. We also know if this process were easy, it would have already been done. Um, so I'm going to ask 
chairs to come forward one at a time. I'll call you up. Um, we've asked each one to give about a three-minute um, summary of, of what we got out of the morning. So to start, kick that off, resources and environment, Robin Brenna. Well, good afternoon. <clears throat> we had uh, two very capable groups go through the room. <clears throat> I'll try to speak up. We had two very capable groups go through the room. Uh, we had three agencies that we were discussing, the Department of Natural Resources, <clears throat> in Environmental Conservation, and Fish and Game. Uh, in total, those three agencies were roughly $170 million of the unrestricted general funds of which the 5.1 billion equates. So 3% of the total budget. Uh, <clears throat> I have about five or six observations I'd like to share with you. Uh, the first one is, is there was, I thought there was tremendous support in the room for the core agency services to continue to be provided uh, to Alaskans. I thought there was a, a lot of green dots when, it, when it, uh, you talked about clean water, uh, clean air, you talked about the Department of Natural Resources, or you talk about fish and game issues, there was, a, there was a lot of green dots saying that those are things that the state should, should be doing. A lot of support for that. I think that in the second exercise of going through, I think the desire was for those services to be efficiently provided. And so there was, uh, the, they sort of changed from all green to kind of all yellow, where, where people, uh, I think, wanted the department heads to use their, uh, their, their, their uh, capabilities to try and more efficiently uh, run government. <clears throat> it became obvious in that process that not all dollars in the budget are equal. There are budgets, I think there was one statistic from DNR that for every dollar of the unrestricted budget they get, they generate $36 with it. There was an example where federal funds match or triple uh, some of our funds. So it became clear in the process that not all do dollars are equal that go into this process and they need to be evaluated as though they, they are different. We had some good conversations about benchmarking. How do you determine how much government is enough and what benchmarks or uh, metrics do you apply to determine that? We talked about benchmarking within the agency itself. How much does a permit cost us to produce this year versus what did it cost us to produce five years ago? And are we getting more efficient or less efficient? We talked about how we do in comparison with other states, but benchmarking with other states for Alaska is difficult. But I thought it was a good conversation. Uh, <clears throat> and then we talked about how you benchmark depending on what stakeholder you are. Is it a mission critical function? or is it, uh, is it just a cost efficiency? Uh, there was a sense among the group that there could be efficiencies from integration of functions. We talked a little bit about uh, merging different agencies, but I think that uh, some of the challenges of that were greater than some of the solutions. So, we st so there was some conversation about integration of particular functions, such as an IT function, data gathering, and, and how to do that. And I guess the last observation I'd share with you is that there was a certain pushback that there was a lot of very capable people in the room put in too small a box. <clears throat> and so what we did about that is we, uh, we expanded our time and with the first group we were able to have sort of a free flowing conversation after this exercise where we were able to share ideas. And I thought that that was a very uh, helpful part of the process and brought a lot of ideas forward which I think will help form the conversation that's to follow. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Robin. Next on Health and Social Services, Karen Perdue. Hello, can you hear me in the back? Good. So we did focus on one agency, uh, Health and Social Services. Uh, health and Social Services budget, as we learned, was $2.7 billion in total spending and $1.3 billion in state spending, which is about 25% of that $5.1 billion. Uh, about 70% of, of that budget is uh, what we would call formula-driven. That is where the federal government or the state uh, laws um, uh, provide a certain level of service, such as in foster care, 
uh, cash assistance to seniors, people with disabilities. And of course, uh, $630 million in Medicaid, which we talked about last night. So we did spend quite a bit of time on Medicaid because it is such a big part of what the work ahead is. And we were reminded that there were 140,000 people today uh, who are children, elderly, or disabled who are using uh, that as their health insurance, which is leveraging about a billion dollars. And I think uh, many people were might, maybe surprised to learn that the, the government, um, both the commissioner and the governor have already identified about $240 million in general fund savings for the program over the next six years. And that is really, when you add the federal match, uh, a half a billion dollars. So that's a big, a big amount of work that is uh, already been committed to. Um, if other pieces of legislation were to pass, um, such as the governor's reform plan, another 330 million in general fund savings could be accomplished. And then to remind the Medicaid expansion uh, saves the state in funds that they're already paying out in other areas, $108 million over that six year period. A net of that, a net of expenses, a $39 million savings. So we're talking big money uh, in Medicaid, but we're also talking about big savings if enough capacity remains in the department and enough will occurs to continue to do these uh, reforms. Our two groups had very little differences in, in the um, voting results, which was pretty surprising because the first group was very focused on uh, people who worked in the business of healthcare and the second was um, very, very responsible, good citizens. So um, most services were critical, abused children, behavioral health, um, health care, public health. But an interesting uh, issue emerged in the area of senior services. Um, there was quite a bit of voting to re-examine the state's programs that we offer to seniors, and particularly the pioneer homes. You remember we have six pioneer homes and they cost about $61 million. And I would say both groups were pretty strong in saying that maybe that model needs to change. Maybe we need to look at privatization. Um, if we can't afford everything, maybe this is an area. And in general, the whole senior services area, um, particularly the group one who had more time said, we need to see all the senior program funding together. And that led us to the question of program budgeting which many of you may remember used to be something we did as opposed to just by departments so that you could see how much uh, funding was going to certain program areas and that was viewed as valuable. Uh, we also were reminded that we have the second fastest senior population, growing senior population in the, in the country. So when you look at senior services, it will be a challenge to do reductions. The other question that really came up was the issue of the pace of change. So if we assume that, that, that things have to change because we can't afford them, how fast can we afford to do them? And this is really important when you talk about seniors because seniors aren't people who can go out and get another job or change their retirement situation. So maybe your time horizon for planning is, is longer because you can't disrupt the situation of the existing person in the pioneer home or the existing person in the assisted living, but maybe the future person. So, you know, when state government is sitting down and looking at their long-term planning for certain populations, uh, they have to realize the, the challenges of the wheels on the bus are turning and you have to change things as, as the bus is going, but how fast can you really do that? Two other areas of focus. One was that the safety net programs have been proven over and over to grow in their need if you are in a recession. So if you are in a downturn and you believe that the economy in Alaska will go into a downturn, I think we can expect um, some of these programs to have more uh, need applied to them and more pressure. Um, there was a lot of discussion, a lot of discussion in group one, because we had more time, about the issue of collaboration and innovation at the local level. And that perhaps with the state being siloed into the various 
budget categories that we're not getting the efficiency that we could get if we did um, provide block grants or some kind of a heavy incentive for collaboration at the local level where they can even out some of the administrative costs and um, make things work a little bit more efficiently between all the different pieces. So that's our report. Um, it, was a, it was a joy to be involved with uh, the group and uh, I thought we had an excellent dialogue. Thank you. And thanks, Karen. Next up, education and training with Bob Williams and Mary Pete. Hi, I'm Mary Pete. I had to scribe, so Bob and I worked on the report together and he gets to give it, so I'm gonna sit down. Hi, I'm Bob Williams, I'm a math teacher at Colony High School, and my, I know it's supposed to be three minutes, but my lessons are normally about 67 minutes, so I'll, I'll try and average those two, no. Um, we, we had a really good session, and it was, it was just, uh, we had K-12 education, uh, Department of Labor, Workforce Development, and the University of Alaska system. And we had good discussions and we had some concerns about process and how to go about, you know, where, where your green dot goes and is it going towards, um, is it saying that you, it's critical, but do you think you need to, can there be some efficiency there, how that goes? But I think what was most interesting was just the, the group of people in the room and the discussions that occurred. Uh, we had Commissioner Hanley, we had Commissioner Dragas, and we had President Gamble. And it was just a great Q&A and, and for us to kind of see some deeper issues. And so that was, was really big. Uh, I think K-12 education, uh, if you look at the bars, we're a very high bar. And, and we are a constitutionally mandated, uh, one of the most important things we do at the state is, is educate 130,000 Alaska students, students that are our children, our grandchildren, and that are, are crucial to the future of Alaska. And so within those discussions, um, we, we had conversations, uh, so we had uh, a couple things that came up was that feeling we, should, we don't want to panic, uh, we don't want to be like a farmer that feels a little crisis and we decide not to buy seed potatoes because uh, basically education and training is, is an investment in our future. Um, we also, I think we, we did a lot of learning um, a lot of times when we looked at stuff, we looked at what's this all else category? Who is all else? And is he living a lavish lifestyle somewhere? And um, particularly at the university, it was around $44 million. We learned that that's really money from the mental health trust, and a lot of it is passed through and goes through other programs. So it, it wasn't some secret slush fund. Uh, but it was good discussions. Um, the other thing is when we're thinking of closing our fiscal gap, and I think you heard it in other presentations. There isn't something where you look around and like, oh, here's, here's some really low-hanging fruit and we're just gonna grab this and that and then we've done it. Um, what we're doing is actually very challenging. Um, it's hard. And uh, we have to make sure that we're, we're, we're committed. We're committed to our students, we're committed to development, we're committed to training. Um, I was also asked to stress that particularly in education, um, where we're used to seeing money compounding, but also education is compounding. If, if we make a change that affects um, the learning of a third grader so that they have a, it's more challenging for them to read and they don't know how to read, uh, that's compounded. It's not gonna be, their learning won't be as effective in fourth, fifth, and sixth grade because they don't know how to read. So we have to make sure that we're committed, we're focused on quality. I think another thing that came out is uh, when looking for efficiencies, and we did see some possibilities from some areas for possibly some collaboration and coordination uh, with uh, technical education and workforce development, um, but there's already quite a bit of discussion on those topics where the university is looking at that, uh, the different uh, K-12 education is looking at that, but those conversations are, are already happening. But it was a, a good discussion. And when we looked at our green dots, uh, we saw a high level of, of commitment and realizing that education and training are very critical. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. I seem to be missing my next two co-chairs up here, so I'm gonna skip over to Public Protection, uh, April Ferguson. And if Tim and Jim would come up so you're ready when I get to you, I'd appreciate it. 
Hello. I'm, uh, our group was composed of the Commissioner, Department of Public Safety, Veteran and Military Affairs, and Corrections. And because there are over three of them, I'm being allowed to give the report out. So I wanted to thank the members of both the groups. They were very civil. There was a lot of frustration, certainly, with the process. It was much easier for group one because they did have a longer period to talk. Group two, trying to compress that exercise into an hour with people who are concerned and have a lot to say was challenging. So the differences that, that we recognize, and you can please go see for yourself on the charts over there, between session one and session two was pretty much uh, the participants of both group deemed the services primarily critical. Those, however, who had, I thought this was very interesting, those that did have a little bit more background or information available to them were more willing to cut services. Those who didn't have, who had less time and less information available to them seemed to determine that the funds allocated for those were probably the right amount. So information does make a difference. And even for group one, I don't think we had enough of information about what all kinds, of, what was going into necessarily each budget category. Um, it made it difficult to you know, vote at 100 miles an hour. I, I also think that the comments that came out of these groups were unique, and I, I hope there's plenty of follow-up, so I'm going to recite some of those for you. So I, I will start with, of, of course, from Bernie Mac, is use the current price of oil as an opportunity to think creatively and get our budgets back to where they should be. So not to go into overwhelm, but to see this as an opportunity that we all have to set our house in order. Thematically, I think the issue that came up repeatedly with a potential for us is to work with the tribes, which made me start to think, do our departments or our agencies or our state really know how to do that? Um, and does each department head, if we say work, to, work with the tribes, does the Department of Public Safety really know what that means or how to go about doing it? There are 240 tribes. There's a lot of work that needs to be done in this area, but again, the topic came up over and over again, and it's not just because uh, there are possibly cost savings, but this is a way to utilize expertise and services throughout a very, very ge geographically big state. Um, for our group also, a lot of emphasis on partnership, partnership with the private sector, with native corporations, with tribes, and thinking uh, innovatively about how to get our hands on different monies, different types of monies, different creative solutions, because the private sector is, is actually very nimble in that respect. There was a very moving comment where a participant said, I'm sitting in a room of haves, making decisions on behalf of have-nots. This time, at least, I'm at the table. Another reason for including the tribes. There was a great uh, suggestion is uh, it would have been helpful to have a side-by-side -side to consider all of the creative ideas from the first transition session, and there were a lot of good ideas then. So where's the follow-on? What were the results of that? And where's the, the feedback mechanism from the agencies as to all of the recommendations that were made by this group the first go-around? Where were we with that? Uh, and so communication back to the agencies, because everybody in session one and session two had such Really, I mean, the unique experiences, valuable comments. How do we create a conduit so they can finish those ideas or add on to them back to the agencies? I mean, what's going to be the website or the address or what's next? We can't waste all of these, the resources we have here. So how do we get the information from these folks back to the agencies of the departments? Uh, there, was, uh, there was some uh, discussion about integration of departments, and I would say, yes, there was a little frustration about the process, both from group one, more particularly from group two, because an hour is not a long time to get all of this done. So I, I thank you for all of this, and I would also ask the state 
um, to figure out a way that we can extract more information. Where's going to be the feedback loop? What? Thank you. Thanks, April. I'd like to invite Jim Dodson and Tim Navarre up for economic development and infrastructure. Thank you. I'll go first. I'm Tim Navarre, one of the co-chairs. Um, my, I'm going to go over the results of the two sessions. Uh, there were some anomalies uh, with them. Um, first thing is, when the first st stakeholders group met on uh, Department of Commerce and Community and Economic Development, they had four critical areas out of the nine, and the second session had four critical areas out of the nine, but only two of those matched. So there were six critical areas. Um, in when you dealt with whether it's too little, just about right, or too much, uh, the second group said every right down the line, 100%, just right. Uh, the first group had six that were uh, uh, about right, one that was too much, and two that was too little. Uh, so there, there, there is some uh, information that did come out of our uh, our process, even though people were. Uh, kind of frustrated uh, at times uh, with the process. Uh, but as you do the, the next session with three and the walk around, uh, come look at some of those anomalies that we did. Now on, on Department of Transportation and, and Public Facilities, uh, again, the, uh, the first group uh, found three critical areas out of the six. The second group had all six critical. Uh, so. And, and for the most part, we all thought funding in both those areas were just about right. There was one low, one high out of, out of both groups. Uh, so that's, uh, that's something to keep in mind. And before I turn it over to Jim, I just want to make the, the comment. I know we were frustrated in that, but keep in mind that, you know, if, if we don't get this right this time and work all together and find the solution, the next generation will only have red dots to play with. They won't have the green and yellow. So thank you. Thank you, Tim. Um, interesting listening to Robin Brenner and, and, and recognizing uh, the, the little I know Robin, recognizing how hard it is to constrain him. Uh, our, our groups uh, felt very constrained, both of them actually, and, and, and kind of, uh, you know, the comments that uh, filtered through the group and were written up on our, in our parking lot. Uh, I'm frustrated over the process, thought there was going to be a more in-depth discussion, and uh, not a conversation difficult to have ownership in the inf information that was produced. So uh, yeah, we're dealing with, obviously, a very, very significant issue. Uh, Tim's absolutely right. Uh, you know, our, our children, our grandchildren will only have red dots if we don't get this right. How do we engage in, in, in a, a meaningful discussion about reducing uh, the cost of, of our state operation and, and finding new rev revenue sources? We're not, uh, Tim and I are pretty adamant that, that we're not criticizing the process, but, but the people that we talk to, no matter how we tried to explain to them, felt like that they had come uh, for three days to deal with this process and weren't turned loose yet. They want to engage in this. They want to be turned loose. And, uh, and they, they, they haven't found that avenue. Now, maybe that's coming. I, I don't know. I, I, I was supposed to show up for some training yesterday. I'm a hard guy to train anyway. And uh, I didn't show up. So um, <laughs> anyway. Uh, this is a process we got to get right. I think this group, particularly the two people, the uh, two groups we met with, are committed to being part of it. Uh, we're willing to put in the time. We're willing to put in the work. Turn us loose. Thank you. Two, re two reports to go. Next is Liz Medicine Crow on government. Hello, everyone. 
Are you guys awake? <laughs> it's kind of like after lunch and you're like, oh. <laughs> so I want to share a few things um, that are, are the concerns mostly that our group um, shared as well as their suggestions um, because you'll have an opportunity in the, next, uh, in the next session to actually look at the charts themselves. So I'm going to just do a real quick kind of rundown. And um, we were uh, in the area of government, and that included Department of Law, uh, Department of Administration and the Office of the Governor. And um, by consensus, um, the entire group, both sessions, decided to give all the money to education. <laughs> okay, I wish, but that didn't happen. <laughs> so first to start with some of the concerns. Um, and it's almost like a true test of our Alaskanness. Like if we didn't bulk at the process, Maybe you were really not that Alaskan. <laughs> so lots of people had, um, had some con uh, concerns, but also I think that they'll be fleshed out as we go through. Um, and there were really, um, really good concerns. Um, one of the other things that was mentioned um, was that the, the segregating of our personal expertise and knowledge from the call to uh, ask what would most Alaskans want was a hard tension for people to try to um, maneuver through. Uh, inherently, uh, one of the other things was that these are inherent uh, core functions of government, and no matter what our determination of criticality might be, um, it's really clear that we have to have the functioning of these core areas. Um, and a, a point that was shared was that these core functions existed before statehood when we had no money. Uh, another tension was uh, between valuing services versus wanting to get in a conversation about the money and how much everything costs and what should be cut. Um, and one of the things that became really apparent was that it was the conversation about efficiencies that people really are excited to get into. Uh, there was also a concern around the educational aspect of the budget dialogue. Um, uh, a kind of a, a moment of reflection was around, will the public be misled if we oversimplify this process too much? And one of the, um, the examples of that, and I thought it was a really great one, was how complicated the state is that we can't make blanket reductions in services if we don't really know the content of what those services are. And the example that was given was within the Department of Law um, and administration um, for both public defenders and uh, uh, prosecutors, prosecutors can get evidence through the law uh, through law enforcement, whereas defenders, public defenders, have to actually hire um, and and seek outside and use outside resources to get the same kind of access to evidence. So a blanket reduction in that area would actually be harmful. Uh, some of the suggestions to benchmark against what other governments who are similarly situated, so not just other state governments, but rather other countries and territories that are similar to Alaska, like the Northwest Territories in Canada or Nunavut. Uh, look for ways to partner with tribes. Uh, there are opportunities to partner with tribal courts uh, and, and multiple other uh, areas. Uh, consider the impacts on the municipalities. Don't just push everything onto the munis. Um, there was another concern that sometimes the assumptions that underlie some of these core functions may not be being questioned deeply enough, so we have to challenge what those underlying assumptions might be. For instance, an assumption might be that a centralized government is the best for Alaska because that's how we do it. Um, perhaps the question is, just because we've done it this way, is it the right way? Um, Make sure that rural Alaska and our villages do not suffer. Just because the cost to provide services are more expensive doesn't mean that the people are less worthy of those services. Um, the other suggestion, um, and really actually some excitement about this, was that people are ready to talk about the revenue. 
people are ready to start putting some ideas out there and be innovative uh, about how we actually fill the gap because the message was heard yesterday that just cutting services isn't gonna get us to where we want to be. Which leads right into the last point, which is that um, kind of overall for both of, the, for both of our sessions, it wasn't that it was so much um, we need less government, it was more of a we need to be more efe efficient with our government. Um, and one of the things that also came up in a uh, conversation on the way over here was around we're talking about right-sizing government, but we don't quite know if we're all on the same page with what that government and that vision of where we're going should be. So there's um, also a need and a question and a, a request for a conversation about vision setting and about knowing where we actually want to go before we create a budget to match it. Goodness, Chish, how up? And our final report out on finance and capital, Dennis McMillian and Aaron Harrington. Thank you. So um, to start, I'll just echo the last thing that Liz said, which is that there was some conversation, particularly in our first group, where we had more chance to range around a little bit about um, where we want to be versus where we were starting. And of course, on all of our sheets, we started with this year's budget, and there were lots of conversations about how that might compare to what a vision for an ideal Alaska might be. Um, I just want to pull out a few high points. So first off, when we added it all up at the end and looked at the ratio of critical to medium to low, overall, um, services are viewed as critical, important, um, or at least of some import in the medium category. In our stakeholder group, we had a ratio of about three to one between um, services that were viewed as critical and um, services that had perhaps a low value. In our non-stakeholder group, it was even higher than that. It was five to one. And when you add the mediums in there as well, overwhelmingly people feel that the services that were being included in the agencies that we were discussing were quite important. The agencies that we were discussing, Department of Revenue, also support from OMB, and we are talking about things like um, the functioning of the permanent fund, the functioning of the PERS and TERS systems, the functioning of the Mental Health Trust Authority. Um, these aren't necessarily services that we're going to take away, um, but people, uh, people really valued them. One of the pieces of feedback that we got is as you're trying to make an assessment to get a sense of the scale of, uh, of the budget numbers that we had on our sheets relative to the value that's provided by some of these functioning. So for example, um, we have the ARM board, which is dealing with the retirement um, management system, you know, having a $70 million budget this past year, but in management having $30 billion. And so um, the advice, especially coming out of our first group, was as the administration continues to go out and have these conversations, lead these conversations in the coming year, to, um, to try to identify places where some additional nuance in helping the general public understand the difference um, or the, the relationship between some of these numbers and the function provided would be quite important. The big difference that we saw, oddly, um, our stakeholder group um, really felt that uh, oil tax credits were going okay. Um, there was a lot of conversation around that I won't even get into, but our non-stakeholder group in general felt like we had too much going on in oil tax credits, but then in conversation said that they also didn't necessarily feel qualified to be um, making determinations about that because they weren't subject area experts. Um, so I think that was a clear place where you could see the stakeholder aspect playing out. On the flip side, our non-stakeholder group really, really valued the services provided by Alaska Housing Finance Corporation. It was critical, critical, critical. Um, whereas the non-stakeholder group was more, it's okay. Um, I would also point out that a lot of the mediums that came out of our stakeholder group, there was uh, an assessment that there was too much resource going to them. And on further discussion, it turned out that it wasn't that they weren't viewed as critical or viewed as important to state government, but that there was a perception that efficiencies could be found, which makes sense when you consider that this was our stakeholder group that perhaps has more insight into some of the real nitpicky aspects of how some of these funds are being managed. Um, so I think for me overall, um, it took away, uh, my, my takeaway was that we have some excellent resources in, in these rooms, um, particularly in our stakeholder groups, people that can help us with the nuanced understanding and help the administration carry forward nuanced messages to support conversations 
about the future. Um, and also, judging from the non-stakeholder group, that Alaskans are going to be willing to listen to new information and change their opinions or shift their views based on the information they can get from their peers. What she said. <laughs> Well, thanks to each of our groups. Um, and now in order to see in a little more detail the work done in the seven areas, and because we know we don't want lots of talking heads immediately after lunch, we're gonna spend the next uh, half hour, 45 minutes or so doing a walkabout. And let me explain. You've heard the presentations by the chairs for each of the groups. You saw at, at lunchtime the, the, the charts going up on the walls here in the room. Many participants have not had an opportunity to participate in the conversation um, outside of the, those two groups that they participated in. So the opportunity during walkabout is to have that opportunity to express opinions. So the, the results of the right size of government for each functional area are posted on the flip charts back in the Dine 49 area. Um, you'll see the, the results of the voting by group members on each of the services and on the a le level of, of service assessment, and the facilitators and the commissioners for each of those groups will be available to answer questions, and each of you are invited to, to add comments um, and questions for, on a form to be provided so we can record that as part of the record of the, this workshop. Now, Governor Walker will be visiting each of the seven. He's going to be wearing a wireless mic, so if you talk to him during the next 45 minutes, you'll be on web stream and TV. Those of you online can ask questions via Cover It Live on 360 North. We'll get those answered. So please go and explore, talk, question, share. We'll start promptly at 3 o'clock with Alaska Commissioner of Revenue Randy Hofbeck demonstrating a new interactive economic model as we explore revenue options. Thank you. This part out here. Yep. Yeah. 
Karen, good job on your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. That was very good. Yeah. I, I would say that read the first group uh, are more ambitious about uh -huh. the I, I, it's interesting for me to hear. And because I think that's that's part of going with the with, with it. Make you change in your way you're delivering something and you're affecting people. And, you know, you really have to take the time to understand how that's gonna. Yeah. Not a fiscal year issue. Yeah, so, yeah. You know, exactly. Plans in your life. So, yeah. so we had good participation, very vigorous. Yeah. There's discussion here. We're now talking to Karen uh, I don't know if there's a way of, if there's going to be a way of income the, with the we need more. You know what I mean? I'm not sure. How, we'll see how that, that's going to be interesting. Uh, and I, I sense people's frustration of wanting to change it. There's a lot of conversation regarding we don't really feel and Hard to, to, I mean, those are all. You could spend one day on every single one of those, oh, one entire day, not more, yeah. every single one of those. So I think that I think that was the, the discount, and uh, I think you did a good good job of, uh, of capturing that. And, um, nice. Oh, good. We have public comment as well. Yeah. That comment of you know, it would be something obviously you'd really have to delve into more, way more detail. Right. Yeah, 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 Especially obviously. Especially since, and, and, you know, uh, my mother just was there and she got great care. And, oh, yeah. you know, people at some point in their life, they don't have a lot of other options. So it would yeah. have to be a long term discussion. And, and that's one of the things I think, I mean, my, my father was in the Pioneer Home in Palmer for uh, these last years, and it just really is a special place. Oh, no kidding. Special place. Yes. And, and, uh, so yes. we really, that would yeah. be a long discussion. It would be thing. something to be very careful yeah. with. Yeah. Um, but again, if they're, these are the kind of tough, tough choices. I mean, this is an oh, yeah. example this, of this the tough is, choices. That feeling is that is exactly the feeling that, yeah. that, that, that we, we have to make. Yeah. So that's why we want to sort of in, invite Alaska so do we to, want the pioneer the, homes? Yeah. If we want the pioneer homes, then yeah. maybe we have to pay for them. And yeah. um, that it's was a, kind of a, our discussion. You know, and the other trade-off I think is I don't think people fully appreciate I didn't either, I didn't sort of, every dollar isn't equal because some dollars are an absolute max. Wisely, and not right. just with a with an act. So, yeah, it's a uh, yeah, good uh, good stuff. Thanks for sharing. I'm sure it brought back lots of memories, Commissioner. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really glad I'm not doing it now. <laughs> Thank you, Governor. I enjoyed seeing you and Val put your head together yes, on that one for a moment. We really did. So, Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah, I
green horn out. Uh, I'm interested to see how, how that comes back with the uh, the, uh, the gun. Robin Brenna. For down talking to Robin Brenna. That happened, uh, that happened with the all all outs. You know, the, if you take a look at the first group, we didn't we didn't know what was in the all out. So people didn't have information to evaluate the category. They tended to okay. be a little more aggressive against it. You know, I was curious to see obviously most of our revenue comes from in the ground. Under either out of the ground or out of the water. And so I'm curious to sort of see how that how that fared, and I've been concerned that people don't have a full appreciation for sort of. I sometimes say, and maybe we'll say, we have a bit of an invisible economy, right? you know, because it comes out of the ground, the water. If you're not near the ground where it comes out, or near the water where it comes out, you wouldn't you wouldn't know that. And, and uh, so I. I uh, I just met with a group of, uh, of students here from all across the state uh, here for eight weeks. I asked to show them hands how many have been, how many have been to Prudhoe Bay, and their two hands had gone up. And, and uh, why would they? You know, why would they go to Prudhoe Bay? But I'm still uh, just driven that we've got to figure out some way of connecting our economy with our educational system at an early, early, early level, so they understand not just from a revenue standpoint, but also from a job opportunity. I just, I mean, if they can get half of or, or fractionally excited as I. I was and, and Dead Horse looking at all that activity. It, it took me back to the pipeline days. I mean, it really did for me. I mean, it was just so exciting to see all all that activity. But it, again, it's a, it's invisible. Yeah, you know, just it just you know, I mean, in Hawaii, you know, if the economy is doing well, the streets are full of tourists. You can yeah. hardly walk on the sidewalk. And if you, you know that. We don't. There's no. We have no gauge other than looking at charts and graphs and numbers and whatnot. But that's that's a that's a challenge. I'm surprised agriculture didn't do better though, as far as from a critical standpoint. Yeah, it's because it's I'm interesting. A, it's a relatively small, uh -huh. small Mark industry Myers. base, uh, but it does a lot of the critical services. And we weren't really able to explain like the inspection of timber. They do that. The plant material center is the source of seed potatoes. Uh, they do the uh, invasive species and plants, like, uh, and so they really have some critical functions outside the traditional farm agriculture. Yeah. So, yeah. so I, I don't think I, I just think really we didn't have time to explain all the missions and how they fit in. Yeah. But, but overall, again, I think we're um, not a strong agricultural state, and uh, well, we have a really strong basis from the Matsu Farms to the Delta. And then we have the growing peonies business, so there's a lot of opportunity for growth, but it doesn't generate current revenue. We did better in the first group with the subject matter experts in the room too. Oh, uh huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. So this is the second. This group. is Robin Brenner. Okay. Okay. All right. Good job. Good job. But the more people understood, the more they supported the services. Yeah. And, and, that, and that's, that's, that's what a, happened in. That's a factor of time, yeah. I think, unfortunately, and and. Uh, and that's also a factor of, of us compressing 17 groups into seven. You know, I mean, it's just, it just, it just tough to, uh, uh, to do that. Uh, because last time we didn't have the revenue side of it. We just, we kind of had the value side of it, but not the revenue side. In order to get the revenue side, uh, we, had to, we had to split it up. Right now. So you, every time you give up time, you, you give up something. When the closing argument is only 30 minutes rather than an hour, you, you give up something as you, as you won't know. So, yeah. Governor, one of my takeaways from this whole exercise is is that we're talking to Kate Troll. A lot of people think that government is the problem uh -huh. and it's wasteful. This clearly shows that people value government as being part of the solution. Mm. You know that because when we were in our natural resources, you see a lot of the greens on the criticals because it's what's driving our economy. You know, yeah. we all want that clean water as well. And so, so. Yep. And that's one of my overall takeaways, is these collection of dots really show that we are about the right size and that government is really part of solving our problems. It's not the problem. Okay, that, I think that's good. I think that's a good, uh, 
and that's the kind of message we're looking for as far as what you know what are we as far as uh, services provided uh, are we the right size are we not uh, we don't come into this claiming to know all the answers at all uh, so I, this is why we did what we did so it's good and you're right about I, I appreciated your not every dollar is is uh, uh, is equal in Alaska. Uh, and I've also often said that about oil. Not every barrel of oil is equal in Alaska. It depends on where it comes from. If it comes from offshore, very different than onshore. It depends on where onshore it comes from. If it comes from NGRA. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, that's, that's a, a, a nuance that's um, uh, often lost in sight because people talk about, you know, throughput and, and the pipeline. And again, not every, I mean, every, every barrel create benefit, but, but not necessarily the same benefit. So, yeah. Interesting, some of the dots are split between yellow and red. <laughs> we, we had one guy. <laughs> Every group has one guy, right? <laughs> yeah. Wow. Huh. Well, as we move into the revenue conversation, I mean, uh, to me, that... Uh, it's, you can have it at different levels, but one level is a sort of a field at a time and what's necessary, right? Yeah. Because different fields can sustain and support uh, different tax policies. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll be interested when we get into that conversation to make sure that the modeling isn't all at a level that doesn't allow that, that field by field kind of analysis. Yeah. Because in general, I think one or two fields right in terms of tax policies that that will more use part of the way for helping solve some of these problems. Yeah. So, Robin, I think one of the other um, things that was really brought out by the participants was this is overall less than 5% of the budget, but it's where our riches of the land are. Yeah. All, all these yeah. three agencies is, is a really small percent of the budget, but it drives the revenue, it drives the use of the land, it drives public benefit in, in the uniquely Alaska way with our huge, huge resource endowment. But it's, again, the actual money we spend on it's only le less than 5% of your budget. Yeah. Did, did I quote you correctly, Mark, that, that for every dollar that goes in unrestricted funds that goes into DNR, that $36 comes back? back. General fund. Yeah, yeah, back to the nice general system. fund. And, and, it's and pretty good investment. Yeah, 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 yeah. If you can put more dollars yeah. wherever that dollar went, that's... Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's probably the highest value dollar yeah. that you have in state government, yeah. would yeah. be my guess. Yeah. I did not know that number before, so that's helpful. All right. One here I was surprised about. I'm now talking to Deputy no, Commissioner Bob Dole about, and Commissioner uh, Lori Hummel of DMVA. I'm not seeing it now. Oh, on the uh, Youth Academy. Right. The Youth Academy. I was really, I was like, wow. We, we were as well, um, especially since we have the public protection group, and so we thought that they would very much understand the ounce of prevention mm -hmm. sort of ethos yeah, yeah, yeah. behind it. So um, we weren't allowed to be excited or disappointed. I know. But I know. <laughs> but <laughs> I would have had a hard time sitting on my hands on that one because um, the grouping had that been combined with OCS and other programs that are lo uh, that are focused on avoidance and or education that are, that are focused on youth and uh, programs like that, we'd have had a different outcome. It was more the grouping and the focus of this group. Having had two uh, two family members go through that uh, program, I have personal experience with that. In fact, uh, at one graduation, uh, Senator Ted Stevens was there because his, his grandson uh, was in the same class as my nephew. So it really is, a, you know, I guess the difference of having actually seen the, that in, in up close and personal. It, it makes me think that we ought to publicize and market a little bit differently the Military Youth Academy. It sounds like it has militaristic overtones as opposed to what it can do for our youth in the future yeah. as an intervention and, and tool. The, and the, the prevention side 
I, I, it's so, you know, boy, we, we catch folks at, at that at that point. It, it's just versus the other the other end with, with Commissioner Taylor. Uh, it's it's just that's what we want to do. So I I mean, I mean I see this as an opportunity. That is from the standpoint is I think I think if people you know better understood that and I know in the in the you know short time frame there, there can't be much explanation but it's sort of a it's sort of a, a gut check of sort of where people are and then just over the off the, and then probably didn't fully understand. On Monday, uh, Channel Two ran a story on Amya facing a shutdown if, with the budget oh, situation, right. and then uh, the commissioner and I were talking and she was saying that when we have the cabinet out at the SEOC yeah. for the cabinet meeting. We can all we we can also uh, try to steer them over towards Amya because like oh, when the tank governor there he'd never been there before. Oh, it's a great, and it's a great. Program. We'll continue to outreach in ways like that to make good. sure it's understood what they do. Good, good, good. Cost avoidance. Rand study says um, for every dollar we put into that program, we save two dollars sixty cents in cost avoidance. Wow, wow. Or put another way, seventy-five percent of your prison inmates are not kind of high school graduates. Yeah. This program turns out high school graduates. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's that's phenomenal. That's very good. That the, the random group, you know, the group of folks without expertise uh -huh. valued the Military Youth Academy more than the group of people who, you know, were in their wheelhouse. So we thought that was interesting as yeah. well. Yeah. yeah. So, huh. yeah. August 29th is their next graduation, and you'll be getting an invite. Oh, good. So, I look forward to it. It'll be my third, it'll be my third graduation. Yeah. You know, on May 26th, we got the lieutenant governor over there. Oh, right, So right, he, right. Had a, yeah. he had a better day than you probably did. He got to go to the State Emergency Operations Center and he over to that. AMIA. Yeah, yeah, he told me about that. Good for you. That was good. I'm glad he did, so. Hmm. The, um, the aerospace program. Well, <clears throat> Bob and I decided it, it, it's a good news story in that you already zeroed out the budget on them, uh -huh. and so we already took the the movement that the people have said we should have taken. I think it was just a vagary of the exercise. It looks like. They think they could save eight million, uh -huh. but they really can't because oh, these. Oh, I see, I see, I see, I see. Their authority, other states. That's their authority to get money from someone other than the state government rather than general clubs. So there's. They validated the decision. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> you're right. You, I like the way you said that. That's good. That's good. Great. Aerospace Corporation. We, well, we're just, we were just talking about that. Were you? Uh, I, I had actually, that should have actually been zero because I had already zeroed that out. Oh, you did? So, yeah, so that, that actually validated what I did, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and with, with their with their cooperation, with their, you know, after con consultation with them, they said, you know, we're talking to we Paul have, Brown. we have 2.6 mm -hmm. million, that we, we can take it from there and move it into a privatization situation. So, so that actually, I had looked at that. Interesting. Sort of, sort of private, it sort of validated that. You um, know, I read your Facebook posts all the time, and, um, and I'm really glad that you keep the Medicaid expansion conversation in front of people. Yep. It's so important. It is important. And, and I respect the fact that you began campaigning that way, and you're still there, and I think a lot of other people do. Yeah. Well, the need is still there, and we're going to continue that process as more and more states, I think it's about 34 states, 34 states have officially adopted. Uh, another four states receive the benefits of it without having to adopt it. So it's about 34 or 35 states. So. Uh, we're getting more and more in the minority on that, so I'm, I'm really hopeful that uh, that soon uh, we'll be able to cross over into that to be able to to provide that opportunity. So, a lot of times people miss is that the, the the benefit of it. I mean, the benefit certainly goes to the individual, but the revenue goes to the the provider. So we have a lot of ho small hospitals around our state that are providing the service, but they're just not being compensated for it. So this provides that level of compensation to the to the, uh, the local. A hospital that's so critical for, for every every community that has a hospital would benefit from this. So it really, the revenue goes to the hospital because they're currently providing some level of a service, the emergency room, but there's no compensation. So.
One of the things I like about this conversation is that it has to do with values. Mm -hmm. And people really need to ask in a deep way, what kind of values do we have as a state mm -hmm. when we can let thousands of people go without the most basic health care uh, and the effect that has on an ill society in so many other ways. Kids can't learn. You have more people incarcerated. P people can't work. We've had some, some reports of people that had, were on parole would violate parole intensely to get back into the system to have health care coverage. That's I, a very, I don't, that's I don't a very, doubt it. Very expensive health care. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Thank you very much. Thank you for for doing a, a challenging a challenging uh, duty. I'm sorry. You're on TV. Everything you say. Oh, what did you want me to say? I'm telling them so your name, Jim Dodson. The, We're talking. The stickies to are the comments. Are the comments? Are they from the public comments? All the stickies or just comments? Oh, the, okay. the people that were participating. Oh, okay. We capture that somehow. I'm talking to Lisa Herbert. You know, your, your sense of frustration with the process, is, is, it gives you a feel for our, our frustration with, with, the, yeah. with the timing, you know, because I come into this thing with, you know, the problem is this big, we have this much time. I mean, it, it's, I mean, as a, as a state, as far as looking at these various issues, so it, it's, yeah, uh, you know, it makes it make the process we're doing Probably pretty realistic, and from yes. some standpoint, just because that's that's where we are. Even though we have, a, you know, years to do this, it's still a, I think a, though a the, big bite. You know, Governor, the way you know the way the sanitation yeah. of the PCE is working, and, and it may work at different and other you know and other rooms because I didn't go to any other rooms. But you know the way it's working is that somebody wanted to discuss. Well, take the international airport for example. Well, you know, there's no general funds in there. What you know why? since we were charged with looking at, you know, un unrestricted, you know, general funds, and we were charged with, you know, trying to cut down where those are spent and try to raise where the where revenue, you know, would go into the unrestricted general funds. Why are we looking at international airports? And that's just one of, one yeah, of the things. Yeah, yeah, good point. Good, yeah. Very good, yeah. very good point. So, um, yeah, interesting, interesting uh, layout of of, uh, of critical versus low. Uh, one of the one of the discussions that's happening across the state now is the, is the Alaska Marine Highway System. Obviously, a very strong um, um, concern in, in those that are serviced by the Alaska Marine Highway System, uh, those that are serviced only by the Alaska Marine Highway System. So. Uh, and then those that, that uh, are far away and whatnot. So we're, it just shows how diverse, but it, how diverse it, it the really state got we in, have. In, you know, in that particular issue, got in, in, into a discussion. So we have, you know, we have a responsibility as, as Alaskans to uh, facilitate the ability for Alaskans to travel, you know, for schools and housing and social services. Mm -hmm. the marine highway system is, is a necessary component of it. But let's take the 250 communities that only have access by air. You know, uh -huh. uh, yep. you know, we don't we don't subsidize the air transportation that goes into them. Uh, so, you know, is rural Alaska is gonna step forward and say, well wait a minute, one and a half one and a half percent of Alaskans travel on the marine highway system and and uh, you know twenty percent you know have to have to reach their community by air. Um, there needs to be brought into an open discussion, you know, how we understand our responsibility as a state to mm -hmm. facilitate travel. Yeah. Well, it's going to be an uh, ongoing discussion and dialogue for, for some time, but the concern is, is that the longer we take to make a decision on some of these, 
um, the more painful it's going to be financially. So that, that's why we're doing this now, early in the summer, uh, so we have the summer to sort of digest what's uh, what's been what's been you know presented here what's going to be discussed you know you know the, the, the second half of this on the revenue side is going to be very interesting uh, and as far as how that's going to be uh, uh, how, how it's going to be addressed as far as be able to pay for what where we are and uh, so it's going to be it's time yeah you know and and uh, um, so and I look back I mean obviously like you a bit of a Alaska history buff sort of see how this has started in the past sometimes. We kind of got partway to it, and then up came the, up came the price of oil, and, and I don't think that, uh, uh, that's going to be happening this time. So I agree. You know, uh, I agree. I was telling a young man this morning that, you know, up, up until the 1970s, you know, after statehood, we were building a state. We got oil, oil started to flow, and we kind of forgot about the process. And now we're back and saying, oh, wait a minute, we need yeah. to build a state. Yeah. No, you're right. You're absolutely right. So, so. Well, and again, thank you very much for what you did on Interior Energy. Um, well, that, that's you. really, really IGU. Is that's exciting? That was exciting stuff yesterday. And, and uh, uh, it's a, you know, somebody asked me uh, in a, in today in a group, what's the single uh, biggest benefit we could do to Alaska as far as our economy? I said, lower the cost of energy. Lower yeah, cost I mean, of energy. No, no, no question about it. It's it really a, needs. It, we need we really need to transcend our thinking from. You know, dollars and the government, and to, you know, to dollars and the people. Yeah, yeah. Building yeah. a state is about building wealth and people. Yeah, yeah. And and and, and I, you know, I'll, I'll just tell you Jim Dodson's opinion on, you know, on, on revenue. Every time you disassociate funding government with with economic activity, all economic activity, then you disassociate people from government. Yeah. And that's what we've done. You know? Okay. Somehow, we've got to we've got to bring back the importance of a job, the importance of a job. Yep. Yep. In so many different ways. I mean, the, the, you know, the one the, the the rising tide that floats lots of boats is a job. You know, so it, I, I couldn't I could I couldn't agree with you more. Yeah. My time up at Dead Horse uh, was so exciting for me for in so many different ways. But one thing I one takeaway was interesting is that you have a population of about two or three thousand people. I don't think there's, a, there's a, any sort of law enforcement there at all. They all have jobs. Yeah. They all have jobs, and they're all and they're all get, you know, you know, acting like, well, if they're the punishment, if there's a problem, they, they don't have a job. So anyway, I, I just can't I, I can't, I can't agree with you more because that was, you're absolutely correct. Uh, the, the, the value of a job is 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 valuable in so many different ways. So that's what that's all about. So yeah, good stuff. Good stuff. Thanks for co-chairing that committee. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, this is interesting. Very interesting. I, uh, it's nice to see that people recognize some value in a lot of this. Yeah. No, they, I, I, it looks like they do. Um, there's only a few surprises to me, a little bit, um, uh, on, the, on the other some of the other 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 programs. I don't see any real surprises here to me. Uh, it, it is interesting to look at the difference between the first voting group, the so subject matter experts or uh -huh. people with some experience, and then the second group uh, with maybe not so much. Uh huh. Yeah. From just a more general perspective. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, Interesting breakout of, uh, of red dots and green dots. More more green than red. Although on the on the on the boards and public quasi public agencies, not so much. I heard one some interesting discussion in one of the one of the groups was that just by seeing that everything's critical and everything is at the right level doesn't necessarily mean that oh well there's nothing we can do it really might indicate that all of the easy work has been done oh yeah yeah that, yeah that the excesses the inefficiencies have been recognized have been dealt with to the extent that we can yeah at least so well, I don't think it's a negative message, or, yeah. or throwing up our hands and saying we can't do anything about well, it. Well, I mean, for us, it's an on, it's going to be an ongoing process. In fact, we're about to roll out to the next, uh, you know, 
30 days some, some uh, reorganization we're looking at, uh, and it's going to be an ongoing process. And so, but you're right, we, we need to do it because it needs to be done. But still, that's not going to, that's not going to, you know, if that's not the silver bullet, but not. No. So. no. So Tim, any uh, any surprises? Any what? Any surprises and how these uh, how these came out? Uh, we're talking to Tim Navarro. That I thought it was um, pretty in that that the stakeholders that have more knowledge in the different uh, departments or areas I don't know if we are or not. actually were more critical than the general yeah. public of yeah. the services in need, which is good because I do know, and I think yeah. they were willing to say, I really do have to break down the critical areas and and move some over out of the critical. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I'm I'm I think the process worked. I'm I'm still I, I'm still anxious to see what the outcome of the revenue side looks like, and I think you're going to see probably you're not going to be able to balance the budget or balance the deficit by cutting state agencies. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think, I think but that's right. a challenge. It, it is. It's, it is a significant challenge. Where is revenue sharing in here as far as? Uh, I see it, it. It did. It did better than I thought. It's uh, community and re, uh, revenue sharing. Yeah, but that number is. Oh, that's the operational cost of the IC. Uh, I see. That's not it, the. Yeah. Right. That's just that's the operational cost operate, of not, the IC. Yeah. We. This is just the operational. Not, yeah. 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 Not the separate funding to. Uh, yeah. To communities. Right. So. Right. Okay. Okay. That did fare fare well. So. Uh, Alaska Energy Authority the same way. Some people think you know, and I think some of the. Uh, fuel cost equalization, again, I think that's in that number. Uh, and, but I was glad to see it, you know, across the board, if you look between needed and critical, uh, you know, 80% went that way. And, yeah, uh, yeah. So it speaks, you know, people have to balance out, and I, uh, I think they did try to do a good job to identify where maybe some areas of, uh, of reduction could happen. Mm -hmm. But at no point did they did they look at these and say this these can go away. Yeah, yeah. None of the numbers showed that. At yeah. Least. That's, uh, yeah, that's good, 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 good. Well, thank you for, uh, for co-chairing this committee with us. That's, no problem. Uh, thank the, you. The revenue, revenue side will be interesting. I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. All right. Hi, Governor Walker. Emily Ferry. I met you this fall. Okay. Um, so I just want to say congratulations again. I'm Thank also you. your neighbor on Calhoun. Oh, She's you are? Oh, that's right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So All nice right. To see you here we love living on Calhoun. We love, we love living in Juneau. Good. And, this uh, has been a nice spring. Oh, it really well. has been wonderful. This is not typical. Is that right? That's not. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I don't know if you actually wow. been there that much with well, the Well, I have. The, the first lady has been there more than I have, uh, but I've, I've been, been gone. Um, you know, I've been typically near where the legislature is because they sometimes have meetings and whatnot. I need to join them and whatnot. Yeah. But, but I, I know, I look every day and see I'm missing some beautiful weather. Uh, <laughs> right. Juneau, so, right. so I'm ready to go home many times. As soon as they get done, I can, we can go back to Juneau. Yes. So, so good, good, good. So, so how are you doing the, the, the process so far? Good. I'm excited about the next phase. About yes, yes. The, uh, revenue. I think there's a lot of ideas there. Yeah, and, yeah, uh, I am too because... Uh, we can't do this what we're doing now very long as far as the, on, the, on the deficit side. So right. um, we're lucky we have a little bit of time, uh, but I look at every every three days we could build a new school. That's right. how much that's how much the deficit is. It's about twelve million dollars a day, so it's it's pretty pretty significant. So that's a good way to put it. But we'll get there. I was um, looking at British Columbia, actually, and they have a tarbin, carbon pricing program there. Uh -huh. um, so that's bringing in, actually, they, they, sorry, they created it so it's revenue neutral. And uh, we wouldn't have to do, I mean, we could create it so it's a revenue generating uh -huh. program. But they have, um, for that program, it's 75% popularity rating. Like, it's hugely popular. And they've oh, had it uh -huh. in uh -huh. place for five to seven years. And I think... Um, it's a really interesting opportunity for our state because there is a groundswell of concern from native communities, religious communities, um, conservationists about climate change uh -huh. and the impacts in Alaska. And so it's kind of a way to consolidate all of those different concerns and support of a, a new source of revenue. 
and uh, there's different ways to structure it. But I it, wonder if that's going to come up tomorrow or this afternoon with Randy's presentation, uh, Commissioner Hoppeck's presentation. If not, you might want to discuss that with him. And again, the purpose of this is to, you know, look as broad as, as imagination as far as what others do. Yeah. Sometimes we look to other states, but we don't look to our closest neighbor, obviously British Columbia, and we, right. if there's some, that's right. something that we can learn, we'll take a look at that. Right. So. And in Washington and Oregon, too, are looking at it, and I think they're all looking at it in different ways, but mm -hmm. we could tailor it to what works for Alaska. It would be nice, too, because then we wouldn't necessarily just be pointing to the oil industry uh -huh. or just be pointing to the public to uh -huh. help, yeah. you know, be kind of uh, joining of forces, potentially, if well, we structured I, it I right. I think one thing that, that, that we've heard is the broad-based nature. Whatever we do, if it's broad-based, the better. Mm -hmm. And so, so that, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll take a look at that and see. So, good, 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 good. And then the other uh, issue I was uh, like to remind you about is I hope that we can cancel that, the Juno Road extension, oh. and move on from well, that. Well, uh, as you know, uh, currently we're going to take it up to the um, EIS uh, process, which isn't that far away. And that's the point where if we step away. We, we know we do not have to pay back. Uh, right. I think it's I don't remember the, that, how many million dollars we have to pay back. So, uh, so we'll we'll get to that point and make that decision based on where we are financially. And so, uh, I think that decision will be very difficult to continue from a financial standpoint. Right. But we'll see where we are. Right. So. And in terms of kind of how what that that final decision is, mm -hmm. um, if we are to go with a all marine option. Um, we could then access the money that the, gen the legislature has already set aside for, um, in the general fund for the Juno Access Project. So general fund dollars that we could then put into the Alaska class ferries to reconfigure those so they're more usable. So it's kind of a... Is that a question? And, well, it's, a, <laughs> it's an idea that I yeah. want to share well, in terms of... I, I appreciate of, that. I'm not um, sure that... I'm, the reason I ask that, because, I mean, sometimes I talk to somebody that all of a sudden that they, this is what they've been doing a long time, and right. I, I'm trying to figure out, from, learn from you. Uh, I don't know if that's possible. That certainly could be looked at. I, my understanding is the money that's right now is just enough money for the federal MAT to do the EIS. So I, I, I don't know. There's actually even more, there's okay. more than okay. is needed there. So. You've been on Calhoun Street longer than I have. Yeah, so exactly. Right. <laughs> okay. So there's a, there's a significant amount of general fund dollars that okay. are sitting there um, that, you know, if we make a good decision about, um, uh, for example, going with an all marine option, a ferry option, then we can access that money to uh, better utilize the ferries that are being built in Ketchikan. Okay. Um, so I could see it. And one of the things that um, I said the marine highway is super important, but I also think that it could be run more efficiently. Uh -huh. And so that, uh, okay. that fits in that scenario of like, okay. how can we do this more efficiently? Good. Um, good, good. Who would be good to talk with about that, just to kind of share some more details about? Um, uh, probably uh, Commissioner Lucan, okay. the DOT Commissioner Lucan. Okay. That's a good one. Good. Okay. I mentioned right. to him, he said, uh, my boss hasn't made a decision on that. I think everyone's <laughs> kind of doing a little bit of this. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Emily. But, Thank yeah, you. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. business here it looks like look at how much money we spend <laughs> how many lawyers do we have on the payroll you know i don't know i I, I think that I <laughs> no excuse me i don't i don't mean you governor i mean uh, that was no we should are, are we on oh yeah. boy <laughs> uh we are and uh you know that's a the uh a lot of that obviously has to do with uh, uh, prosecutions, uh, the, you know, statutory required to provide a, uh, a public defender, and those uh, those kinds of folks, whatnot. So, you know, um, Governor, there's only there's one thing I, I, I I'm concerned. I was just explaining to, to Joe here a little. I'm concerned. I, in sitting in the in the two sessions I sat in, you know, it looks like there's so much stuff that's critical, and you can see the green dots, and I'm I'm afraid that. We might not look at the synergies where we can save the money. I, uh, Joe was just explaining there's synergies they're looking at where, where if there's one or two or maybe three agencies, they're going to work together. And if they got a helicopter and go out and inspect something, all three agencies could go in one helicopter instead of three. Mm -hmm. Now that makes that's just mm -hmm. just common sense. Right. But I, I'm I'm a, I hope that I hope we don't look at this and say everything's necessary and we're not going to. Well, the reason for the high price tag on Department of Law, Attorney General Craig Ritchie has been explaining, we're one of the states with the higher costs of Department of Law because we, most states, most other states, 
prosecute cases at the local level. Mm -hmm. We do it all at the state level. Yeah. That's why it's ah. all, all, all felonies are at the state level. Well, you know, I'll tell you, Senator Kukish came up with uh, an idea of having tribal courts yep. and all the misdemeanor stuff being done in the. I, and, and I thought that was brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely brilliant. Yeah. Who knows better? what the feelings of natives are than the natives themselves in their villages where these yeah. people live and where the elders are at. I really believe he hit on something yeah. that could save the state a fortune. And it's cost us 146 bucks a day to incarcerate someone. You could give them $70 and have them stay in the village. Yeah. Yeah. I hate to break it up, but we're getting started with the economic model. Okay. No, that's all right. We're getting started. Think, think funny. Right. Thank you very much. Welcome back to the Wood Center Ballroom here on the University of Alaska Fairbanks campus. I'm Chancellor Brian Rogers. We welcome our online audience as well as the participants here. We've had an opportunity to explore the right size of government, a discussion that could and will continue for days. But now it's time to move on to revenue options. And here to outline the issue is Commissioner of Revenue Randy Hofbeck. Randy was appointed commissioner by Governor Bill Walker in December. He's got 30 years of uh, experience in tax administration, valuation, and appraisal of real estate. And the last 20 years, he's been directly involved in or has assisted the Department of Revenue and the North Slope Borough in the administration and valuation of North Slope properties. Please welcome Commissioner Randy Hofbeck. Thank you. Um, when I first started working in December, and it became readily apparent that uh, we were going to have some real fiscal issues moving forward. I started talking to the governor about uh, revenues. And uh, he told me it wasn't time yet. And, uh, and so I've been on the bench for six months. And, and it's finally my turn to talk. So, uh, so settle in. I think some of the frustration that people felt this morning, the process was difficult. Groupthink is always a hard thing to try and work through and quantify. But I think it also um, really points out to the, just how difficult this process is going to be. I mean, even people in, the, in that first group that were stakeholders and had a significant knowledge about the, the uh, issues that they were dealing with still struggled with, the, with when it started to really get down into the details of just how, how to quantify uh, the value of those particular um, services. And then even, it gets even more tricky when you try and put a dollar value on it. And so <laughs> this, it, this is going to be a very difficult issue. And I actually you know, um, need to applaud the legislature and, and the governor in being able to make $800 million worth of cuts in this first year, because uh, that's, that's unprecedented. When we, when we started, the governor, the governor laid out a plan early on that we would get our own house cleaned up first that before we would ask anybody else to participate in, help in bringing this fiscal um, imbalance back into balance, that we would look at our own house. We would, we would find out what it is that we could do to streamline and deliver services more in, uh, if it, efficiently and inexpensively. Um, we knew that when we laid our first set of cuts on the table, that the legislature would make additional cuts, and they did. And, they, and they, they, had, they held the public hearings and they, and they worked through some very difficult issues and they're at a little bit of an impasse on the, on the, the last of those issues. But to, to get to where we've gotten so far in, the, in six months is, is, is pretty remarkable. But now it's time that we talk about the other side of the coin and start talking a little bit about revenues. I heard, se heard several people talk about uh, fiscal crisis. The reality is we don't really have a fiscal crisis. I think the governor uh, expressed it well in, in his state of the, of the budget message, that we have, this is a challenging time. This is a time uh, that, that's going to be difficult, but it's a time of opportunities. It's a time where we can really kind of reshape the uh, government within the state of Alaska and what, what people expect to be delivered in services and what we can deliver. And the reality is that only, it's only gonna become a crisis if we don't act. Uh, we, we have the, uh, the benefit of uh, large savings, and we have a, the benefit of being able to work through this process in a systematic fashion to get to an answer. But we do have to act, and if we fail to act, we take a challenge and we turn it into a crisis. One of my favorite quotes is from uh, Teddy Roosevelt, and 
<coughs> that he delivered in, in uh, Paris, France in 1910 and from his uh, speech, Citizen in a Republic, uh, where he says, it's not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither knew victory nor defeat. I think that's, that, 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 that's a mantra for what we have right now, in that this is no time to be timid. I heard somebody say that one of the, when one of the, the presenters talked about this isn't a time to be timid, and that's exactly it. This, this is no time to be timid. This is a time where, where we need leadership, we need to step up. The discussions are going to be incredibly difficult. But the discussions need to be had. And the decisions are going to be even more difficult but the decisions need to be made. And this, this group that's here today uh, is the group that we're hoping will take the message out. Certainly, the governor and his staff will take the message out. The legislature will do uh, their process to take the message out. But we're also hoping that this group here will also take the message out and really start talking about some of these, these uh, solutions that um, nobody's there to talk about. Nobody wants to talk about them, and, and we need to start talking about them. I told my wife that I said, if, if, if I do my job this summer, by this fall, I could be the most hated man in the state of Alaska. <laughs> and she said, I'll still love you, <laughs> but don't take my dividend. <laughs> so to, to start this discussion on... on uh, Revenues, I think I first want, I need to debunk a couple of myths first. One that I heard a couple of people talking about and also actually read it on a few of the blogs that are at the bottom of the, of the articles, which are, you really shouldn't read those things. Um, <laughs> but it said that this was all a setup, that this was all being made up because, so that we could implement a, uh, 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 an income tax or to take the permanent funds so that we could continue to increase the size of government. Uh, that is just simply not true. The last thing in the world we would do is this, if we had a choice of something to do. Uh, this, is, this is real. This is real and it needs to be worked on. Um, so the, the first of the, of the myths that I want to talk about is this idea that we can cut our way out of, the, uh, out of, this, uh, out of our problem. And these, these graphs have been up here. Uh, uh, Gunnar had uh, something similar to it last night. Pat briefly went through one uh, this morning. But it really is kind of this comparing ourselves to ourselves as far as our budget it, um, expenditures. The, and this first one just kind of shows, if you just look at the budget in nominal dollars, you know, how much have we grown over, over time? And it looks like government has grown dramatically. But as Gunnar talked about and, and David Teal talked about in his presentation, uh, and Pat talked about, um, if you actually adjust that for, for inflation, you see that uh, our, our expenditures now are, are not that much different than they were in the in the go-go days of uh, right after the pipeline boom. But if you make that one further uh, adjustment and, and look at our spending per person, because obviously the more people you have, the, more, the greater your uh, uh, demand on government services, your higher your spending, you make that one last adjustment and you find that uh, our spending now is lower than it's been at any time since um, uh, the mid-2000s, and if you actually, look, this doesn't show the, the cuts going into next year, and if you add those in, we're down around the area that we were in 2006, and we're at almost uh, record or historic lows for spending per capita uh, statewide. We're definitely down in the area of, of the mid-2000s and close to where it was before the pipeline boom. So that, 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 I think it's critical to understand that when people say that government is bloated. But let's take, let's look at uh, the other chart that, that Pat put up, and that's really, um, if we have compared ourselves against ourselves, what if we compare ourselves against other states? And I think you find a similar uh, uh, result that Alaska, although we're above that line slightly, the, 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 that median line, that, or the regression line, um, that uh, that's not unexpected because of the cost of delivery of service in a state like Alaska. And, and if you actually put numbers to that, it, it brackets us somewhere between, I believe Pat said this morning, 5.2 and $4.8 billion in expenditures. And we're sitting right now at, at, right in the neighborhood of $5 billion. 
So we're right, we're right in the right range also as well as compared to other states. But I want to take one other look at this. And I think if you, if you want to put a silver lining into a dark cloud of the, the difficulty the legis leg legislature is having from trying to close out the end of the session, when they delivered an underfunded budget and the governor was forced to make the cuts to make that a balanced budget, we got a dramatic demonstration of what a balanced budget looks like with current revenues. We get uh, life, health, and safety. We get, uh, and we get su essentially support for life, health, and safety. The, the techn uh, computer technology, um, payroll, things like that, that still have to be online. And little more than that, that's what we get for $2 billion. That's a balanced budget right now. And that's missing, that's, that's missing education. The schools don't open with that budget. We're short a billion dollars for education in that budget. We're only funding half of health and social services. We need another 550 million to fully fund that. We, we don't make a cont contribution to the public retirement uh, system with that, with, that, with that $2 billion budget. There's another 250 million. And we haven't paid any oil and gas tax credits, and we have $700 million worth of uh, tax credit liabilities. Yeah, those up, you've got $2.5 billion. So the $2 billion plus the $2.5, you're at $4.5 billion. Think about that number. We're at about a $5 billion budget right now. People are talking about wanting to do 10% more in cuts. That brings us to a $4.5 billion budget. That's what you get for $4.5 billion. You still don't have any public services. You still don't have ferries that are running. Your roads and your buildings aren't being maintained. Nobody's doing audits or collecting taxes. You could go through each of the departments and, and line out what's not there. So that last set of cuts, that last uh, uh, bit of cutting that we can do is going to be very, very difficult. In fact, um, it's, going to, it's, it's going to require cutting direct services. I mean, you look at these numbers, and, and is, could more money be taken out of the, the, the life, health, and safety? Possibly some money could be squeezed out of there. Could we, could we squeeze education and health care, and, and can we, could we deliver services more efficiently? And the answer is, yes, we probably can. But to squeeze another $500 million out is a pretty big squeeze. And so that, this idea that we can even get the 10, uh, that additional 10% cut is a very, very difficult proposition. So I would, I would say that uh, the idea that we can actually cut ourselves to a balanced budget is, is, is something that uh, just is not a reasonable expectation. The other thing that, the other myth I think we need to look at is that we can, uh, that oil will uh, bail us out, that oil will save us one more time, like it did in the 80s and in the 90s and the, in the early 2000s that we either got price or production that would, uh, would bail us out. So I had my staff put this together and uh, just plot, uh, plotting production across the top and price down the side. The red is where we're still underwater in the budget. The pink is where we're close to being uh, balanced. The green is where we're just slightly balanced, or the light green, and then the, the dark green is where we're getting into more of a solid financial uh, fiscal territory. And you can see by looking at that that there's really no plausible way uh, that, that oil and gas revenue is going to bail us out this time. We have lower rates. We have lower production. We have lower price. And right now, if you looked at where we're at, we're at about the 500,000 barrels a day and about $60 a barrel. So the third, third box down on the left-hand side at $2 billion. That's about what we're generating. For us to balance the budget with current production, we need $110 a barrel oil. And as Gunnar pointed that out um, last night, that that is just not uh, in anybody's forecast at that period, of, at this point in time. And if we were to balance the budget at $60 a barrel, um, I don't even know how far out you'd have to go for that to occur. We're, 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 not, we're barely more than 60% uh, of the way, or three quarters of the way there. Uh, no, 60% of the way there, um, even when we get out to um, 800,000 barrels a day. And certainly nobody has projections of that type of oil production anywhere in the future. So I think the expectation that somehow oil is going to bail us out is also one that we just have to say is, is, is false. Uh, 
we, we aren't going to get bailed out this time by, by oil, which means we have to make the decisions on how to balance the budget. Um, just shortly, we're going to put, put our, our revenue forecasting model up that my, that my staff developed, and I, I just have to give them just more kudos than I can possibly imagine um, for, the, for the work that they have done on this model. There's really three things. That this, this presentation today, the model and a white paper that was put out yesterday, it's about 27 pages, 29 page white paper that really, that really starts the discussion on a lot of potential revenue options all kind of fit together as a single presentation. And, uh, and I, I just applaud my staff for the work that they did in putting it together. The model itself, I've had several people that, that, that have looked at the model, and they said, well, can, can you get it to model multiple levels of progressivity? And the answer is we could, we didn't. Um, or they'll say, can you get it to model this interaction between this tax or this, this other social response to it? Uh, the reality is that what this model was built to do is to give a visual representation with accurate information below what it's going to take to close the fiscal gap. It'll help in selecting which, which items uh, will be the most powerful in closing the gap. It'll help in the discussion of which ones do we want to take on and you know, uh, what, what political capital are we going to use up in, in getting certain items uh, passed. But if, there's a, if, if a certain uh, uh, path is chosen, this isn't the model that's going to walk us the, all the way there. There's going to be a much more detailed modeling behind those processes uh, at that time. But this, this is a, an accurate reflection. Uh, it's backed up by a substantial number of tables and, uh, and um, uh, formulas that uh, I think there's like 30 tabs behind which you actually can see in the model where all the calculations are occurring. And so with that, if we could put the model up so we can, we can play with it a little bit interactively and you could kind of see how the model works. And when we, after we do that, then we'll go back and we'll actually um, um, uh, talk about a few of the revenues that, uh, that uh, are embedded within the model and, and, and some of the kind of put some uh, some values to some of those revenues. I think that we had, we had a, a, a cheat sheet on revenues. Is that around someplace that we were going to uh, hand out at this point in time, just so you've got them? Um, that it'll be a document you'll be using tomorrow um, in, in your groups, and I'd, I'd love to have you look at them tonight and kind of get an idea for you know, how much you can generate from certain revenues. Um, and so you have an idea when you walk into the room of maybe um, uh, the a few selections that you would like to see um, used during that, during that interac interactive process tomorrow. But for, for today, we'll pass out those so you'll have them, and uh, we're just going to just kind of demonstrate a little bit here on how the model works. Um, first thing we want to do um, is to set the, the official forecast uh, to $70 a barrel. I'm going to actually, after I, Gunner talked last night, I thought, you know, Gunner got it wrong. He was way too optimistic. <laughs> uh, and because we actually run out about a year earlier than what Gunner was explaining in, in his forecast at the $70 a barrel. I think, um, I think $70 is a reasonable place to, to, to set the estimate for purposes of, of trying to balance the budget. I think most people are talking 60 to $80 a barrel is a reasonable range going forward, at least in the, in the near term. And so I think 70 is, is probably the place to, uh, to really look at that. So if you look at the, that, that split up there, you can kind of, if you're looking at the model right now, the, the, the top three um, charts up there, or graphs, the, the, the one on the left is the uh, SBR, CBR fund balance. SBR actually will be gone at the end of this fiscal year. So it'll just be CBR, our constitutional budget reserve. And you can see how quickly that spends down if we do nothing. It's, it's spent out, um, if, uh, the, the table will tell you it spends out in 2019, but it's actually there's very little left in 2018 and just enough to trickle into 2019 if we do nothing. The, the center uh, graph represents, uh, the top red line is, is expenditures. The, the blue line in the, in the middle is revenues. 
and then the bars at the bottom are, is, is, tells you just how, what, your, what the uh, fiscal gap is. Rather than having to try and figure out how much uh, distance is between the two lines, that just gives you a, a graphic representation of, of what the, the deficit is. And you'll see that uh, it, it's a deficit that grows over time. The, one of the reasons that it grows over time is, is shrinking production. Um, the other is that this it, embedded in this model is actually the, the, that government will grow in size by the, by the price of inflation. That, that in fact, you can't lock government down forever uh, uh, at zero growth uh, without that actually accounting for substantial cuts over time. The model could actually be set to, to zero. Um, can, we, can we set it to zero? I think that's disabled on it right now. Yeah, it is, okay. But um, the, the, the model could be set to zero as well and just assume flat government over the, the period of time as well. Um, then down, and then on the right is the permanent fund balance. So you can see the blue line is the, the corpus of the fund, and then the red line down below is the permanent fund earnings reserve. And the permanent fund earnings reserve is that portion of the fund that's actually available for appropriation and expenditure. And you see that that also spends out by about 2020, 2021, um, if we do nothing. And the, the, assumption on, the assumption on this model is that uh, we will spend our savings in the CBR first, and then when the CBR runs out, we will have no options but to spend the permanent fund earnings. So the, the status quo just makes that assumption, that uh, we wouldn't just stop paying bills, that we would then start spending the earnings. Obviously, that's a decision that would have to be made by the legislature, but that's, that's the underlying assumption within the model. Down the, then down the middle uh, of the model is a set of, of tables that will actually show you how much uh, uh, the, the cuts that have been made and additional revenues have been, that have been generated by individual, by the choices that you make. Um, then underneath that is a chart of, of um, the, your permanent, the permanent fund dividend, dividend estimate on what that would, would be under various um, uh, scenarios. And below that then um, the Yearly budget and revenue adjustments, it actually gives, is, it's, it's te it gives you a table, but also underneath will tell you what your revenue and uh, budget adjustments are numerically. And then below that, um, uh, there's a color key. And if, if you are successful in balancing the budget, uh, the, and you run out of some of your money, but not all of your money before 2030, uh, that table will turn yellow at the top. And if you're actually successful enough that you still have money left over in 2030, uh, it'll turn green. So, um, uh, so the, you know, you'll know when, when you get there. And then below that, it is just, is just tells you when the, the various funds run out of money uh, if, if, uh, under various uh, revenue scenarios. So those are just some, some, uh, some tools to help you kind of uh, track how well you're doing. Going back up then and over on the right-hand side, is where we enter, where we can enter cuts, and, and we actually have gone in, and based on the work that you have done, that you did uh, this morning, we've entered in uh, numerically about what we believe the uh, value of the cuts that, that could be made based on the values, the, the the overall values that you've put on certain aspects of government, and um, we actually. There was actually upward pressure in some of the some of the uh, some of the departments for actually increasing spending. We we artificially limited those to zero, and did not um, increase spending anywhere. We just simply dealt with the cut side of the equation, and and you were successful this morning in your exercise in take in cutting twenty million dollars out of the budget. <laughs> And I think that really tells you just how hard this is going to be. People value the services that government offers. And they've been delivered for a long time at very little cost. And the idea of switching to uh, paying for those uh, is going to be difficult. But I think it's even more difficult for people to actually uh, think about living without them. And so, um, so we're going to talk heavily on revenues. We're going to continue to work the cut side. But I think the focus, at least for me going forward, is going to be how to fund government in the fashion that people would like it to be. The, then on, yeah, that's, there's the cuts. Uh, uh, if, if you'd actually, 
Hey, could go, go down on the, on the school, or on the, on, the, on the funding, go down to the years, because it's by departments, and then here we can make cuts in years. Put a 10% cut in for 2017. Just so we can, that, that looks, neither one of us can actually read it from where we're at. Yeah. Um, that, that's roughly about right. You'll see that even that 10% cut, if we were able to cut down to, to that 4.5 billion, um, how little that closes the gap in our fiscal uh, situation. The dashed line above is the shadow of where we started, and the, and the red line is where we've, where we've gotten to. So you see that, um, that even, even that the level of a cut is, doesn't get us even close to balancing the budget. So let's play a little bit with, with some, of the, some, of the, uh, some of the budget cuts. Um, the, I'm going to have to step over here so I can see. On the, on the revenue options, um, let's go in and, and set the, uh, the permanent fund to an endowment model. The, uh, it's been called POMV um, by others, but it's, it's essentially an endowment way of, of, of managing that. Um, set it to, you, uh, can you set it to 4% or 4.5%, which would be similar to what Representative Hawker's bill indicates, and then um, set it to 50%, or you could just, um, the share that would go to state government. So it's one past the bottom. David told me that he actually can't read the numbers from where he's at, so he's doing the best he can. Okay, so now you can see on the blue line that if you, if you actually went to a, an endowment methodology for managing the permanent fund and, um, and limited the, uh, uh, and then used 50% for funding government, 50% for, for, for permanent fund dividends, that you can start to close the gap. But you're still, um, you're still two billion short next year and about a billion and a half the year after that and then it starts to grow again. So it, it, it won't close it, but it, it, it gets you, uh, it's one of the steps you could take. Let's uh, scroll down. There's been some talk about uh, uh, using, uh, collateralizing the state uh, f finances as, as a method for, for uh, our state assets as a, as a way to fund government, essentially borrowing against our assets, investing with the hopes that you get a greater return on the investments than what it cost you to borrow, and over time that would grow the value of the fund and would, would, uh, would generate additional revenue. So go ahead and implement the, the investment. And you'll see that moves it a little bit. But it, 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 you know, I think there were some people after uh, uh, talking about it thought that was the magic bullet that would get us there. It gets us about $300 million a year when it's fully implemented if everything goes well. And that's a big if. Um, this is really a very risky time in the market for, for investing. It's, it's, you can borrow money for nothing right now. But there's a lot of money chasing the good investments and, it, and, and, and the good investments are priced high. And if you get a market correction, you take a lot of risk by, by using that type of a methodology for, for generating revenue. But over time, it should generate revenue, but there'll be some years where it'll be positive, some years that'll be negative. Over time, it should generate revenue, but, it, it, but it's not the panacea. It's not the, it's not the ultimate way to get there. Let's scroll down a little bit further. Yeah. And let's, uh, let's change since we're, come back up a little bit. Since we're in a low oil price environment, let's... Um, Let's raise the, the minimum tax from 4% uh, to 10%. There you go. And then, so see there, that changes it as well. And you get a little bit of a, a bump early on, um, uh, but uh, it, uh, Again, it, it brings it closer, but that, that doesn't get you all the way uh, there either. Scroll down and let's, let's, uh, let's do everybody's favorite and let's do uh, income tax. Let's do the income tax, um, add it, and then set it at 15% of the uh, um, federal liability, which would be similar to... Uh, Representative Seaton's bill, and then let's let's add let's add in the uh, capital gains tax at ten percent as well. Okay, now you can see you're starting to get you're starting to get close. 
You haven't turned yellow or green yet, but you're starting to get close. But this is the process that we're going to ask you to go through tomorrow. And there, there's actually 30 options in there, and some of those options have uh, multiple um, uh, selections you can make within the option in order to, uh, to uh, bear down even a little bit further. But we're going to ask you tomorrow to sit down uh, with your group in a room, working with your facilitator and a, a modeler from my staff, and just walk through and start selecting options until you find a, a set of options that could get you to a balanced budget or until you give up? <laughs> the answer is you can get there. You, you can get there, uh, particularly if, you, if you, you recognize that the CBR and the permanent fund earnings, um, those, are, those are viable assets to use in, in balancing the budget until such time as we could get to uh, a gas line. And let's, let's scroll down. We aren't, gonna, we aren't gonna do the gas line tomorrow uh, as far as, as an option, but scroll down and just punch the button on, uh, to, to um, implement the gas line. Should be the first one there. You see with that, that ultimately, if we can, when we get to a gas line, it will, it will, be, uh, it will give us a revenue stream that will uh, put us, uh, make us fiscally uh, sound as well. But it's gonna take expenditures to get there. It's going to cost money to get there for the state's investment. And, um, and on this one, because you've, you've added a lot of other assets, you, you kind of bottom out right before the gas line comes on in, in your savings, but, but you make it to the, make it to the end. If, if you hadn't put in uh, an income tax and, and some of the others, you actually would run out of money um, before, the, before the pipeline came on. Um, as well. So anyway, so those are the things that you're going to play with tomorrow, and, uh, and, and hopefully you'll be able to come up with some creative solutions. The idea here isn't that the, that the, the administration has uh, a select group that they want in play. We are not endorsing any one uh, option or any one set of options. We really want you to work through all of them. Um, and, uh, and the 30 that, we, uh, that you have available to work with uh, tomorrow, uh, obviously aren't all of the potential options or the ones that we've modeled. If you come up with others that you would like to have modeled, by all means, let us know. And this model will be dynamic. You know, check in every now and then on the website. It's on the website right now. And um, you can um, uh, check, uh, see what, how, what updates have been made to the model and, and what new additions there are for, for trying to balance the budget. Um, could you flip to that next tab? Along the, there's a, the second tab on the model, in case you lose the, pay, the, the sheet we just passed out, um, actually describes uh, every one of the cells that you could do an entry in um, and uh, what, what it represents um, and, uh, um, and some, of the, some of the assumptions behind it. So that, that's, on, that's also on the model so that if, you, if you're, you're wondering about what that button really means, you can flip over to the tab, scroll down, and you can find it. And, and, uh, what, what, what we're actually modeling with that particular item. With that, if we go back to the PowerPoint. One more page. Oh, I got it. Never mind. <laughs> so this is what you're going to start with tomorrow. You're going to start with an assumption of government that will grow over time with inflation. No, no new programs, no new uh, services, just simply the fact that services will get more expensive over time. And, that, uh, and with $70 oil and with uh, gradually falling production. That, that's where you're going to start tomorrow with, with, your, with your project. I'm just going to kind of go through some of the some of the categories that you can that you'll be dealing with tomorrow. Um, the the first one is uh, the repurposing financial assets. We modeled a couple of those already. We didn't model pension obligation bonds. That's, that's something that's come up as a as, as a potential way to uh, defray some of the costs of the of the uh, retirement funds. Very similar to leveraging the assets, the the collateralization. The same type of issues that uh, timing's everything. And uh, if we had done it uh, five years ago, six years ago, it would have been a very, very good, uh, robust uh, revenue stream for us. 
but if we'd done it in 2007 going into 2008, uh, we would not have liked the results anymore very much. So uh, timing is everything on something like that. But, uh, but pension obligations and bonds are, are an option. Uh, they've been mentioned before, and, and we certainly are, are doing the due diligence on, a, on that, working with our financial advisors, whether that makes sense at all moving forward. Um, the permanent fund earnings, you can do it either two ways in the model. You can do it status quo and just spend out the earnings as needed. Uh, or you can go to the POMV model like we had demonstrated. Or there's another model in there that's also the, that was uh, um, uh, proposed by Senator McGuire uh, that actually kind of flips the use of royalties uh, for, for dividends and, and uses the permanent fund for, um, um, uh, for funding government. Um, so um, th those type of options are in there. And again, they're all, they're all described in the various ones. And then the collateralization and securitization. And, and in looking at that, I think one of the things we have to be real careful about is there's certain, there certain aspects of generating revenue that are going to generate new money for the economy, money that's not already in circulation. And certainly in spending investment earnings is one of those things. They, uh, they, right now the money is invested, it's essentially shipped out of state overseas, it's being invested elsewhere, it's not being invested in the state. And, uh, and so any money that we would spend from the investment earnings is actually new money in the state, it's money that's not in the economy right now. And I think that's critical to remember because some of these options are simply going to be recirculating money. We're going to be taking, if we put an income tax in, we're taking money from one group, repurposing it in the government. And, and spending it elsewhere, but it really isn't new money in the economy. And, and one of the things I learned in one of my first classes in, in economics was uh, just some basic tax theory that says, if, you, if, if a government charges zero in taxes, it receives zero in revenue for funding government. And if a government spe uh, taxes at 100%, it receives zero in revenue for government because essentially there's no incentive then to produce. So the right number is somewhere between zero and 100. And, and the idea is finding that right balance. And certainly right now a lot of our taxes are set at zero. And that creates a problem because if there's not some kind of nexus between economic growth and the treasury in government, economic growth becomes a drag on services. If, if economic growth doesn't convert into some revenue for the government, it actually takes away services from others as you get larger economy, more, you have more people, to, you have more schools that you need, you pay out more permanent fund dividends, um, the roads have more pressure on them, they need to be fixed, all of those kind of things that create those services. And if there's no revenue that's generated by that growth, it, it, it constrains government. And so we need to recognize that as well as we're looking forward that taxes aren't all bad spoken like a revenue guy. <laughs> so then another one that we could look at would be modifying oil and gas taxes. And one of the things that we want to be real careful here is that we don't want to turn this into an oil and gas tax debate. Oil and gas taxes are just one of the options. And I think, uh, you know, if, if you kind of picture it, you know, you've kind of got this, the, the state that's been divided up into oil and gas taxes, uh, earnings from our investments and other taxes. And, and, and we've de depended entirely on, on only one of those three legs for years to fund government. That leg has shrunk. That leg is smaller than it used to be. Government has grown to a certain size. It can only shrink so far. And so it's time for the, the other two legs to actually start to carry their burden as well. And so uh, we, we have to, in any honest discussion on the state's uh, fiscal situation, talk about oil and gas taxes. But I don't want anybody to misinterpret this as saying it's time to go after the oil companies again. Is there room to modify oil and gas taxes to make them more efficient, to make them work better, work uh, more, uh, generate more incentives for investment while still being fair? I think that's an honest and intellectual discussion that we need to have. But to simply say uh, it's the oil company's fault that we're in this situation, uh, I think is, is, is disingenuous. That's not an honest statement. The, the, the reason that state has the wealth that it has is because of the oil and gas industry. And so we need to appreciate that, but make sure that we, that uh, oil and gas uh, partners, that, that, that they're treated as partners, that you know, everybody's held accountable and everybody um, contributes what is the proper amount to be contributed. So there's several other th things here. We could raise the base rate. We could, we could raise the minimum tax. 
We could change the, the special provisions that have been uh, put on new oil that allows, that incentivizes looking for new oil. Uh, cooking and production taxes could be changed. There's a, just kind of a unique little aspect of cooking and production taxes that when, when we changed from the ELF to PPT, the cooking and taxes were held harmless. And at that point in time, oil in Cook Inlet was paying zero in severance tax. So Cook Inlet oil pays zero in severance tax right now. That doesn't expire until 2022, I believe, that provision. Um, is that something that could be changed early? I don't know. It wouldn't generate a lot of revenue. There's not a lot of oil in Cook Inlet. But, but there's, there's certain provisions like that that, that I think it, it's, it's, it's worth looking into. Uh, the hazardous release surcharge. surcharge. That, that, I think, was a wonderful demonstration of just how hard this process is going to be this year. We actually, the, the, we, we actually adjusted the, the hazardous release surcharge this year with the help of, of the legislature, and we're able to increase it by so, something slightly less than a penny. And it generated, I think, $7 million, uh, uh, seven million in new revenues. And, the, and the, the angst that was felt over actually ha having to implement that new tax was, was incredible. And that was for $7 million. And we're going to ask the legislature over the next few years to come up with $3 billion. Um, it, it's a heavy lift. It's a really heavy lift. And, and that's why we have to do it together. And then one that was put on here, the natural, natural gas reserves tax. That was something that the reserves tax is, is something that is part of Alaska history. We had an oil uh, reserve tax before the pipeline came on. The provision uh, basically was a loan against future revenues. The, the, they paid the tax uh, to fund government before there was oil flowing, and then when it was flowing, it became a, a deduction against their, their taxes later on. And so over, over time, it, uh, and it's the way it's structured in the model, it, it's net zero, but it could generate 800 to a billion dollars in the interim uh, if there's a gas line coming on uh, online. And there's a speaker that'll come up after me that'll, that will talk a little bit about some of the negative impacts of, of decisions like that as well because certainly they can have a dampening effect on exploration and, uh, and other things. And so there's, there's a balance here. It's not all just about the numbers. All of these numbers have socioeconomic investment uh, decisions that are behind them as well. So uh, it's not all about which one will generate the, the, the highest number. Sometimes it's which one generates the best number. The other side of the, of, of the tax issue for oil and gas, of course, is credits. It's one that's gotten a lot of publicity. Uh, there's really two types of credits. There's the reimbursable credits that are for, for exploration and development of fields and, and net operating losses for companies that don't, ha don't have production. Um, and, and those become reimbursable credits that the state pays directly. That's that $700 million number that, that you hear about. There's also um, uh, the per barrel credit uh, in, in that the, the producers pay in, in, on the North Slope. And that one is actually a deduct against their, their tax that they pay. And it really is, although it's called a credit, is really an integral part of the tax system. So um, it's been called a credit, it's called a credit in the statute, of it, but it, it really is just part of the base tax rate. But it, it's also uh, something that, you know, you could, you could adjust the credit rate as, a, as an option. Then we have the idea of modifying um, non-oil and gas taxes. Um, corporate income tax, um, mining taxes. These are all these taxes already exist. Fish, the fisheries tax, motor fuel tax, and sin taxes. Sin taxes being alcohol, cigarettes, uh, our new baby marijuana. Um, that uh, that could could be adjusted as well. And the reality is, the last significant tax change that we had before that the the, the surcharge tax was 10 years ago. And it was for, for um, uh, cigarettes and alcohol. And there's a 10-year gap where we have not changed any other tax except for oil and gas tax. There's, there's not a lot of uh, appetite for, for changing taxes, particularly when there was, and we had robust revenue. There wasn't a lot of reason to, for the discussion to even come up. But the, the discussion is, is there now. And, and, uh, and the, the, the sin taxes were the ones that were uh, last adjusted. And if you actually, actually look at them in, in, your, in your table, you'll find that we're at some pretty high rates right now. Uh, our alcohol tax is about as high as any in the nation. Our cigarette tax, I think, is 10th highest in the nation. Um, our marijuana tax, I have no idea. <laughs> we're, we're somewhere between first and third. <laughs>
and then we can add new taxes. Uh, Health care provider tax. Um, interestingly enough, we're the only state in the nation that doesn't have a health care provider tax. And uh, there's, a, there's a description of, of that tax uh, in, in, the, in the handout, um, but it, it, it's, it's one that could generate a substantial amount of income and is actually uh, not speaking for industry, but is generally supported by industry because of the Medicaid reimbursement component of it. So, um, and, uh, so it, it, that's one that uh, uh, is, is a potential. Uh, business license or gross receipts tax, really that's kind of a... Um, an easy to implement sales tax where the, 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 uh, the taxpayer pays on their gross receipts rather than you know, running a tape on, the, on every uh, transaction from the cash register. Uh, income tax, and we used to, of course we used to have an income tax. There's many, many flavors of income tax. It's actually one of, the, one of the easier ones to implement if you implement it just as a percentage of federal income tax. It retains the progressivity within the federal tax structure uh, without, uh, with, uh, and basically you file a return that, that says what you paid in your federal tax and you pay a percentage of that. There, there, there are options and you know, there's some issues you have to deal with in where you earn, where you earn the income and stuff, so it's not, Totally simple, but it but that that can be implemented e easier than some of the other taxes. Um, capital gains tax, of course, uh, associated with that as well. Uh, a payroll or school tax, uh, which was a tax where the, your first couple paychecks that you get every year, a certain amount would be taken out, um, uh, and it's essentially a, an employment tax. We had that in the past in Alaska as well. I think it was about a hundred uh, ten dollars before. I think the, the uh, proposal that's out there right now is progressive from $100 to $500 uh, per person, per um, employee. Sales tax, everybody, a lot of everybody's favorites. And this one's interesting because I, I know there's a lot of people that, uh, because so many communities within the state already have a sales tax, uh, think of it as, as a local tax. But nationally, it, it is very much a statewide tax. And, uh, and and it has its pros and cons. If you've already got a high local tax and then you put a, a state tax on top of that, uh, you could reach some, some levels that are not acceptable, maybe even get capped out. Um, but also having worked on, on, in rural Alaska for, for the last eight years, there's a lot of smaller communities that don't have the capacity to manage a sales tax on their own and have very few ways of generating income that would love to have a sales tax where they could actually piggyback off the state's tax and just add a percentage or two of, of their own onto it. So, so it's got its pros and cons, as most of these do. And then the one uh, on a statewide, then we also looked at a statewide property tax. That would have, if, if the entire state was incorporated, that would be a very easy thing to do. And we could just add a portion to everybody's mill rate and collect the tax. Unfortunately, a, a large portion of the state is unincorporated, and we just simply don't have the data of, on what um, assets actually exist out there and what they're, what they're valued at. So it could be implemented. It certainly uh, is a possibility, but um, it would be one that would be, take some time to implement. And then the one that actually generated the most interest of all the taxes when, when we started this discussion is this idea of gaming and a lottery. Uh, actually, the first phone call I got on revenues yesterday uh, was to talk to me about Powerball. And uh, after the reporter finished the interview, she was a little bit sheepish about it because she said, of all the things we could focus on, they wanted me to focus on, on the Powerball. And I said, well, we smiled a little bit too, but you know, it is kind of a sexy thing, right? It's, it's, you know, everybody's got Powerball. There's very few states that don't. And that's easy, Powerball's easy to implement. It's really essentially like a contract to implement it. Um, and so when most states start this type of uh, an activity, they would start with one of these national um, mega millions or Powerball or something like that. And then eventually develop their own in-state um, lottery uh, type uh, games as well. But so, so the, the, the idea of gaming is out there as well. And, and it's something that comes up. And um, many, I've been in Alaska since 1980, and, and it seems to come up every few years as, as a way to, to fund government. So those are the options you'll be dealing with tomorrow. There's 30 of them, and, uh, and some of them will generate a lot more income than others, uh, but I, I, I encourage you to, to have some fun with that. 
I think the things that we can really, uh, conclusions we can draw from the, the discussion, what we can draw from what happened this morning and trying to, the, to look at the, uh, the cuts, and I think we'll, we'll even be brought home even more so tomorrow, is that there's no easy answer to balancing a $3 billion budget deficit. That's a lot of money. And, and so it, it's going to take work, and it's going to take a, a, a lot of um, uh, people to really, you know, we're, uh, courage is the wrong word. Uh, it's not really an issue of courage, but people are going to have to have the desire to make it work. And I think it's really going to take a combination of four things. It's going to take continuing uh, restraint in our spending. I think that's, that's a commitment the governor's made, and I think it's something that is going to be critical not only to long-term success, but for people to accept the, uh, the, the fact that um, these, these revenue enhancements are coming. Um, we're going to have to have taxes that impact individual Alaskans. We're going to have to look at changes to oil and gas taxes. And we're going to have to look at a strategic use of our legacy assets, the CBR and the permanent fund and other investments that we have. And I think it's going to take some combination of those four to get to the answer, maybe all four of them. Um, and uh, I just uh, I, I look forward to seeing what you model tomorrow. And with that, I will turn it back over to Brian. Well, thanks, Randy. And I think we're all look, looking forward to the opportunity to do some of that modeling. But first, we're going to take a brief, about 10-minute break. There's water and coffee, um, Arctic Java downstairs um, as well. Uh, when we come back, we'll talk about some of the economic questions to consider when we, uh, when we look at the revenue options. Please come back in 10 minutes. You're watching Building a Sustainable Future, Conversations with Alaskans on 360 North and 360north.org made possible by support from the State of Alaska Office of the Governor. We're in the second day of this three-day conference here in the ballroom of the Wood Center on the campus of the University of Alaska Fairbanks. And a good part of this second day, the participants have spent in smaller groups addressing questions of right-sizing government. Right-sizing government is a movement mainly among those who would like to cut down the size of government to allow it to focus solely on protecting individual liberty. The idea behind it is that society is better off when government is minimally involved and that businesses and individuals will succeed or fail based on merit. The idea is not necessarily popular among those who view the concept as an attack on government services they believe exist to protect people. Today's assignment for right-sizing government was focused on balancing the values, services that people would like to see versus the cost of those services. So it was framed in terms of that relationship. And we heard some uh, discussion with a governor earlier and participants on the results of those discussions. The second set of conversations this weekend will focus on closing the fiscal gap, which participants will take up in the first sessions of day three. And th in this plenary, we have just heard from Department of Revenue Commissioner Randy Hoffbeck giving an overview of revenue options and laying out guidelines for tomorrow's discussions. When we come back from this break, Dan Robinson, the Chief of Research at the Department of Labor, will be outlining questions to be addressed when considering choices for developing revenue. And then Commissioner Hoffbeck will return to go over tomorrow's agenda, after which the Chancellor and the Governor will wrap up today's efforts. The PowerPoint projections and presentations that you've seen and many of the documents 
and resources that speakers have referred to, you can find on the web, 360north.org, to look over for yourself and join the conversation online. You're watching Building a Sustainable Future, Conversations with Alaskans, made possible by support from the State of Alaska Office of the Governor. So building a sustainable future is not just about state spending, and it's not just about state revenues, but it's also about the state's economy and the impact of those decisions on the state's economy. We're going to hear next from Dan Robinson. Dan returned to the department in 2011 after spending two years at McDowell Group, an Alaska economic consulting firm, and before that worked as a statewide economist for the Department of Labor for eight years. His work experiences included time at a Washington, D.C. energy consulting firm, a New York City law firm, and the Alaska Attorney General's Office in Anchorage and Juneau. Please welcome Dan Robinson. Thank you. Um, you're going to be delighted to hear that after a full day of numbers, uh, you're going to hear from somebody whose professional purpose is to produce numbers. Right? So if you're not number fatigued yet, then um, I'm not going to number fatigue you because unusually, uh, I'm not going to talk as much about numbers as I usually would. Our shop produces uh, with the federal government many of the economic statistics that tell us how we're doing broadly as an economy. So the number of jobs we have, uh, unemployment rates, population, wages. Um, so we, we have a lot of familiarity with that data. And that data is usually how we decide if we're in a recession or not, how we're doing. And we've seen some reference to those numbers. They're not the only ones, but they're some of the key ones. So what that, that gives us at the Department of Labor is, is, I think, some understanding over time what moves those numbers. It's far from perfect, and that's going to be my first point. And let's just start with um, numbers, yay. Um, 736,000 people in Alaska. Uh, there are three states with fewer people. Um, I'm going to name two and see who can yell out the third one fastest. Wyoming, Vermont, North Dakota. What a smart audience. So $37 billion in personal income. Not all of that income is from uh, wage earnings, but the biggest chunk of it is. The other pieces are transfer payments and then dividends, rents, and income. And then $60 billion in uh, gross domestic product, that's, that's the value that we produce in Alaska, the value of the goods and services that we produce. Um, so th my main point in starting there is to say our economy, every economy of that size and, and significantly smaller, are, are far too complicated to know with any precision what happens when you push here or create a new tax there. Th if somebody tells you, uh, if you do this, that will happen, then be suspicious because um, I was thinking earlier in one of the conversations that there's a part of this exercise that involves spreadsheets, and that's an important part. And I'm fascinated by the model exercise, and I, I hope you're as interested as I am to, to play with some of those numbers. But um, our numbers, as, an, as economists, are a little different than accountants' numbers because our numbers tend to wander off sometimes. Sometimes they lose confidence, right? They stop doing what normally numbers do. Sometimes they even change their value. Show me a CPA who has to deal with numbers that changes its values. They, they don't, right? So our numbers are, are fuzzy and our, our numbers aren't fuzzy. The, the impact of changes to an economy are fuzzy. But, but some key economic concepts to keep in mind as you think about not the, not the political viability, not the fairness, that's, that's a conversation for another day, but primarily the economics of, of the, the likely effect of some of these things. So let's jump right into this concept of new money. You, you, that, I think this, is, this will be intuitive if you're not already familiar with the concept. There's a certain amount of money circulated in our economy, uh, and some of the options we'll discuss will tap into new sources. 
Others will move money around, um, maybe to great effect, but, but that's, that's a, a key concept to keep in mind. This new money, um, I added this slide, this, this slide kind of late in the game. Be careful not to associate that with free money because as I said there, if, if we, and, and I think there's some risk of this. If we go through complicated contortions to get the money from somebody else, then we risk creating uncertainty in the form of, of lawsuits. We're a state, not a country. There's a limit to what we can do. Um, and then also, uh, economics, to a lot of degrees, is a, is a study of incentives. And uh, we, when we raise taxes, we change the, the incentives for things so we can, we can uh, cut up our nose to spite our face by trying to get somebody else to, to pay all of our way. Uh, multiplier effects, usually you hear this in the concept of, of something positive, right? The Fairbanks, a fascinating study of military and the university, the direct effect, and then all the multiplier effects, all that that supports in terms of retail jobs, construction, everything in Fairbanks it depends to some degree on those things. Um, but multiplier effects work in reverse too. So if you, if you were to lift those things out of Fairbanks, not immediately, but the, the consequence of that would ripple through the economy and lots of things not, that you may not think are associated directly with the military, the university, would, would eventually be affected, and in, in fairly short order. Um, so just to illustrate that, at one end of the spectrum, imagine a, a, an income tax on somebody who works at a remote work site, non-resident, so they, they, they uh, collect their, their check and go home. Not a lot of multiplier effect when that, when that money comes to the state. They weren't spending a lot of that money in the state anyway. At, at the other, other end of the spectrum, we've got something like the PFD, especially for low-income households. We know we see in our numbers, which are job numbers, better numbers would be sales numbers. There's, October's Christmas in Alaska. That money gets spent. So that has a larger multiplier. When that comes out, you create uh, more in terms of, uh, of a whole than if you do some of the other things. Uh, this, this, this instability is a, is a we're, we're, we're experiencing some of that right now, and we'll, we'll come back to this topic. But what instability does, it, it creates extra costs, and it discourages investment. Um, some of the extra costs, imagine um, insurance costs, lots of extra potential costs. And, and if you're unsure, we saw a lot of this nationally with the Great Recession. People were reluctant to make big decisions especially. You want to wait and see. You want to wait until you're sure you're going to have a job next month before you buy a house. Lots of things like that. So, so instability is one of the, the, the broad things to keep in mind. Uh, I couldn't resist. I, I was just so starved for a graph because this is usually the, the bulk of what, what we produce. So, and I, I think this is relevant. This is the 1980s um, job numbers. So, um, uh, and, and the point here is not to look very specifically at the 1980s. The point, as my title suggests, th this, this demonstrates um, multiplier effects and economic instability. Um, we lost, from 1985 to 1986, more than 5,000 construction jobs. Over the course of those two years in the red, we lost 3,400 retail sector jobs. We lost 2,500 government jobs. Those things weren't directly related to the oil crash and the, the uh, the uh, housing uh, problems, the bank closures, but they were downstream related. Um, a couple of other things just to note, that growth in the early 80s was really out there. 10% in 1981, really strong growth. And there's no really um, specific point about that other than to say, since I've been doing this at the Department of Labor, the, the highest growth we've had is 1.8% in 2005. Um, the, the losses were four, five percent. The highest, the biggest losses we've had, 0.4% in 2008 during the Great Recession, which um, we described that as a, it was a glancing blow for us. It didn't, it didn't do a whole lot to us. But we all felt that. So it gives you some scale of what happened in the 80s. And then something people forget, potentially, or, or occasionally we hear, we kind of roared out of that recession, which was, I mean, that's strong growth uh, in 1980. 
1989, even 1988, 3,600 jobs. It's been quite a few years since we've added that many jobs in a single year with a much bigger base. Uh, so before we're going we're gonna to look at some basic pros and cons of some of the, some of the options you're familiar with that Commissioner Hofbeck talked about in, in much more detail. But uh, keep these two things in mind. We have these really powerful, this one especially big powerful tool that really would be the envy of other states. Um, that's part of what makes this problem solvable, uh, a big part. Another one is that, is that and this, you've heard this uh, yesterday from Gunner, you heard it this morning from Pat Pitney, every other state except New Hampshire relies heavily, not just relies, relies heavily on either a state sales tax or a state income tax. New Hampshire's kind of fun, they have a statewide property tax and some, some income taxes that are, that are uh, kind of special. But, and, and just to reinforce that point, here's the graph again, gray or blue, Gray is uh, individual income tax. Blue is general sales taxes. So you see there's, there's us in New Hampshire, the only ones that don't rely heavily on one of those two things. I'm not saying that that's what we should do, just that, that other states have done what we are thinking about doing. Uh, we're not, this is not a really unsolvable problem. So let's look just specifically, and this is, this is meant to be very wide angle. When we talk state income tax, uh, one of the pros obviously brings new money into the economy to the extent it taxes non-residents. Um, we have, and that 20% of all workers, that's workers, and that's by the PFD definition of residency. So that's on the high side. That's not 20% of the income that's paid. So, so be careful not to think that, that we can get 20% of, of, uh, of that, uh, some pot from non-residents, that would be exaggerated. But that is an important piece. We're not taxing that income. And that's, like we saw in the previous slide, that's fairly unusual. Most states, if you work there, you pay an income tax, whether you live there or not. Um, so the other thing, uh, lower multiplier than some options. And then the other thing, a deductible on federal income taxes, it, uh, a lot of, a lot of it's, it's, it's different, different places, but to some degree, the amount you pay in state income tax is usually deductible in your federal income tax. So that's money that would have gone to the federal government that's now coming to Alaska. Uh, this lower multiplier, we'll talk a little bit about that. When you, uh, um, so that's a pro here in terms of the amount of money we take from Alaskans. We take some out, but uh, to the extent we take it from higher income Alaskans, they tend to spend a little bit less of it. So it's, it's a little bit of a lower multiplier. We won't uh, belabor that point. This bottom one, it's almost um, circular that, well, yeah, you reduce Alaska's household disposable income by definition, an income tax takes some income. But, but you are, the, part of the point of that is we are moving money around as opposed to infusing more money into the economy broadly. State sales tax, same, same basic pro, we bring mo money, new money into the state to the extent the spending is done by non-residents. Uh, both uh, state income and state are fairly stable and extremely stable compared to what um, we have become accustomed to um, in terms of uh, how, how wide the fluctuations can be with oil and gas. Uh, the cons, Commissioner Hofbeck touched on this, many local governments already have sales tax. Also, um, relatively high multiplier because sales taxes uh, tend to hit uh, lower income households spend a higher percentage of their income so uh, you, you take a little bit more mon money out of the economy when you uh, go for sales tax. Uh, permanent fund earnings, this one is interesting. Uh, significant revenue potential have you seen? We've, we've got this, this big pot. Not saying we should spend it right now but, but it's big enough that the earnings are large, potentially. Uh, could be a very stable source of revenue, depending on how it's structured. Um, let's see, and then uh, obviously the con is that, that when you start to spend even the earnings, then we, we don't reinvest that, and it doesn't continue to grow, and then the, the possibilities for spending off even more money in the future are out there. Um, so the permanent fund dividend itself, also large, um, 1.3 billion, I think uh, Gunnar said yesterday. 
Uh, again, uh, like with the sales tax, larger impact on lower income Alaskans. And um, rural Alaskans especially, there are, there are parts of the state that uh, don't have very much in terms of cash economies. Um, so this would hit some of those places especially hard. Um, and again, not a, not a value conversation or a fairness conversation here, but just uh, to the extent that money goes and is spent, uh, it leaves a bigger hole when you remove it. Uh, so oil tax increases, I deliberately put this one towards the end. Obviously, this could, we could talk about this forever, and, 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 and I think there will be lots of conversation about this. But, but it's uh, very broadly, uh, the pros, it, it's, it's a very large amount of money that gets generated because of our oil resource. And the con, uh, you, you tax something, you affect the, uh, the balance. Maybe at the margins, maybe, uh, maybe the margins matter, and, and you, but you, can, you do affect behavior. And, and when tax structure move, taxes move around a lot, you also affect behavior. That's, that's, you're, you're injecting some uncertainty into the investment decisions. So the miscellaneous other, very interesting. I, I was fascinated to hear about lotteries and, and the white paper from Department of Revenue is, is excellent, talking about there's some really fun history about how far this goes back. Um, the, and so I've just put them all together. The pro, uh, it adds some diversity, and diversity of, of almost anything usually tends to create a little more stability. Uh, the con, that all of those things combined um, get us about $200 million, so we're not we're not uh, solving the big problem here. We're, we're helping solve the big problem here. So uh, final thoughts, and um, this touching again on the idea that, uh, that this is a, a problem with, a, with some solutions that uh, won't, we won't have to, we won't have to um, you know, uh, invent something really fancy to solve this. We have significant economic assets, and, and what I've, put up here mostly are things that we offer to the, to the global marketplace. Um, uh, Scott Goldsmith talks and writes eloquently about the three-legged stool. You've heard about that. Oil, federal government, and all of their basic sectors. The, the other basic sectors, uh, fishing, uh, our fish resource, uh, tourism, uh, uh, air cargo is one, that we, we bring money into the economy by having that strategic location that, that brings some of that. Timber used to be a, a significant one, not so much now. But these things, uh, th this, is, this is a lot to, to build an economy on. Um, and the bottom one I'll just mention, uh, we have a more mature service sector than we used to. So that means that the money that we do bring in circulates a little bit more. So maybe in 1980, if you need a dialysis or a neurosurgeon, you, you go to Seattle. Now maybe you stay in Anchorage or, or go to Fairbanks. Um, lots of examples along those lines. Um, and, and, but th this basic sector idea, we, we sometimes think about it of, of engines on a plane, um, and you can afford to lose an engine or two. We've got uh, some really big engines that we really can't afford to lose. Um, and and I, as I was putting this together, I, I thought, if, if people read the things that we produce, we produce Alaska Economic Trends every month, you read a lot about health care. I thought, I thought, I wonder if anyone will say, where's, where's health care on this? Keep, health care is, is not a basic sector. Uh, construction is not a basic sector. Those things are the body of the plane or something else. So those things depend on, on uh, and they are, they are a key part of that bottom bullet. But that, that allows us to keep more mo th that money here. But, but the, the basic sectors require a special, I think, uh, special attention. Um, and in a way, I kind of like uh, the idea of a motor because you have to pay attention to a motor. A leg on a stool, you know, it's, it's pretty good. Um, <laughs> it cracks. <laughs> All right. So uh, finally, we, we, we do some forecasting. And in other states, the forecasting that the people who, who do what I do do, gets a lot of attention because of state income taxes. What we say we think is going to happen affects revenue forecasting. In Alaska, we kind of toil in obscurity because the oil revenue forecasting is what matters as, it, as it's appropriate. Um, but, but we do that. And in, in thinking about that, if, if I'm forecasting, then, then the biggest risk I see is that we will, we will create unnecessary costs. Right? We're going to have some costs. We know that. 
but, uh, but, but if, we, if we dither or if we disagree, d democracy's messy, we all know that, but, but we, there's some risk there that, that will, will create some costs that, that may not be necessary. Uh, and, then, and then this other one, uh, confidence, if, if you paid attention during the National Recession or uh, uh, to our uh, 1980s experience, you know how much confidence matters. Somebody's condo didn't go from being worth $150,000 to $20,000 because the price of the materials changed. It, it went from that value to the, to the lower value because people didn't think they could get a buyer because it's, that's what people were willing to pay for it. So confidence is very important to an economy. And, and having big looming economic issues that aren't being addressed will affect uh, consumer confidence and business confidence and bond ratings confidence. One of the reasons, if you read uh, Fitch or Standard & Poor's, they talk about we have a uh, large rainy day accounts. That's part of what makes us low risk. Uh, that could change, obviously. So, so it's, it's worth paying attention to that uh, as, as part of the puzzle. And that's all I have. Thank you very much. Well, thanks. So now we have a better idea of what the revenue choices are and, and initial thinking about what the impacts of some of those are. Uh, remind everyone that there is some homework to do um, to take a look at the model that's available on the Sustainable Future homepage. Um, and I'll have a few more announcements after we hear once more from Governor Walker. Well, once more, I want to say thank you. Today has been a long day. We have put you through a lot. Uh, Randy, thank you very much for that presentation that you gave. That was, that was excellent. I know you've been waiting a long time to do that. And I said, Randy, you can't do that until the legislature's out. <laughs> then I reconsidered that. So, so uh, thank you very much for, uh, for that. That's a di difficult message to deliver. But you know, some things happened during the last break that I just want to comment on briefly. You know, people came up and said, you know, someone said, talked about the motor fuels tax and said ours is the lowest in the nation, this, not the other thing. Someone came up and said, said, well, what about the person that lives off the grid out in a cabin? Is that still going to be a, 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 an option uh, in, in Alaska? Boy, that really, that really touched me. You know, that's a, that's a, we have to keep that in mind. And, and that's why we're doing what we're doing. We're doing, that, we're doing this to, to hear those things, to hear that, that conversation. Someone that, that, uh, that drove in here from, from that lived partway between you know, Delta and Toke, they're really important to be part of this dialogue, part of this discussion. If we hadn't done this, we wouldn't have heard that input of how do you live off the grid in Alaska and still survive if we implement all that we have, have, have proposed. And because you saw things on a screen, doesn't mean we're gonna, gonna click off and that's what we're gonna, we're just gonna punch a button and it's gonna happen. It's gonna be a discussion about, about what are we going to do. I am quite honestly a bit relieved at this point to have this on, on the screen, to have this presentation from, uh, from Commissioner Hofbeck, <clears throat> to be able to begin that dialogue, because we have to begin that dialogue. You know, I will be the guy in the, you know, mud and blood in the, uh, in, the, in the ring, and I hope others will, be, will join me in that. And I'm willing to do that because that's what it's going to take in order to, go the, to, to turn this situation around. We can do it. You know, we've been there before. Uh, we know we can do it. It just takes the guts enough to step up and say, this is what we're going to do. So this is the essence. This discussion we're having is the essence of how you begin that process is you, is you in, invite and involve as many people as possible into the, into the discussion. So I'm, I am, I'm pretty invigorated. It's kind of a strange thing to say after, after the presentation. And I will ask my wife if she will love me, as Randy's wife has said she will at the end of the day, because we might be pretty lonesome, buddy, when that one's said and done. So I know you got a boat in Juno, so we might be there. Um, <laughs> So thank you again for, for, for great presentations, great attention, great participation. Uh, this, is some, this is some heavy lifting we're getting into. Now we're getting into the real meat of, of, uh, of what it's, what it's going to take. You probably have a feel for the magnitude of what we're talking about. There is no, there's no silver bullet. There's no one lever you pull. There's no two or three levers you pull. And you have to be careful when you pull that. You pull it too hard, there'll be a reaction someplace else. So this is... This is I'm, I'm pretty darn excited about where we are right now. So thank you very much for, for, your, for your day, for what you've done. I know the evening is on your own. We, do we have anything after this, Brian? I just, I got a couple more now.
Okay, a few more announcements. Uh, you're on your own this evening. I think we've given you a lot to talk about today uh, on, uh, with the morning, uh, uh, the work you did this morning, uh, what was presented this afternoon, lots to discuss. I'm sure that uh, my email box is going to be full uh, immediately now that we're, we're talking about the T word and uh, that we can say it and uh, say it without hesitation. So it's really the R word. It's, it's a revenue. It's a revenue. What, what are we going to do to, to, uh, to, to fix our economy? Our economy is broken right now. And I, I, I like to fix things. Um, usually something a little bit smaller than this, but, uh, <laughs> but I still like to fix things. So thank you very much. So before we close, just a reminder that the, um, the model will, will be set up um, for anybody who wants to uh, work it at the Greening Building tonight between uh, 7 uh, p.m. and 8.30 p.m., or you can go to the Sustainable Future homepage, download the model, play with it uh, as, as much as you'd, as you'd like tonight. Breakfast tomorrow, 7 a.m. Um, here. Uh, remind you that the, the programs actually start in the classrooms tomorrow at 8 a.m. And I'd ask people to please be prompt so we don't end up with people trickling in and, and interrupting that discussion. Please be there if you can right at, at 8 o'clock. We'll come back to the web stream at 11 as we report out on, on Sunday. And, as, and so uh, uh, again, no sleeping in in the morning. Um, dinner's on your own this evening in Fairbanks. When we started yesterday, I, I talked about some of the history of this place and, you know, Trasiada is a place to, where people gathered to, uh, to discuss important issues of the day. Sixty years ago, that was to discuss a constitution for the state of Alaska. And I'd just like to highlight the fact that we have one constitutional convention delegate here with us tonight. Please uh, join me in honoring Vic Fisher. You're watching Building a Sustainable Future, Conversations with Alaskans, made possible by support from the State of Alaska Office of the Governor.